Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, brothers and sisters. Uh, I put the link out early and mashallah, people started joining before the stream even started. Uh, but if you want to start now and start joining, inshallah, ta'ala, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, as mashallah, most of you know, uh, this is a dawah clinic. Um, and so as a consequence, um, it's dawah related questions. Uh, if you have any dawah related questions, please come on and then inshallah ta'ala we will try to answer them. Um, the doctor will be joining us. We have also invited Mashallah Sheikh, inshallah, who said he will probably join about in about an hour, inshallah. Uh, so with that, uh, let's not uh, talk too much because I do have a habit of going on a bit. We'll get to Sister Tina on straight away. Uh, she's Mashallah our regular and she doesn't like waiting. She gets very upset and angry with us. So we can't have that. So Sister Tina. Uh, Asalaamu As Alaikum. Welcome to the stream. Wa Alaikum Asalaam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. I can wait. I don't mind waiting. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I'm just joking. Um, so uh, if you want wisdom, then you're going to have to wait for the uh, doctor. Um, but in the meantime, you've just got little old me, inshallah. Yeah, I'll settle for you. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So how are you doing, sister? First of all, you okay? Alhamdulillah. I'm very happy. Mashallah, how is your dawah strategies uh, working out with... Um... Actually, um, I'm the question I'm, I'm going to ask today is not from me. It was directly from my mother. Okay. She said, okay, I want you to ask them this. And I'm like, are mm -hmm. you sure this is what you want me to ask? She said, yes, this is what I want you to ask them. Mm -hmm. So do you want me to ask it? Oh, bismillah, <laughs> why not? Let's just go for it. All right, then. Um, I had to translate it because she said it to me in Spanish. So in mm -hmm. English, it says, uh, if Islam is actually the true religion, mm. then why are all the prophecies of the book of Revelation being fulfilled just as the Bible says? Okay, well, the, the thing here is, um, and this is important, um, she's talking about a book revelation uh, that has already changed and been manipulated and been added to right. and many of the things in the bible that are prophesized you find the actual earliest text with that prophecy is often post prophecy it's after the prophecy has already been fulfilled right. so it's like somebody is ad hoc going in and adding things in to somehow prove that this prophecy was made before the prophecy actually, or the event actually happened. But in rea in reality, sometimes the earliest texts we find actually come afterwards. So has she got anything specific? Because the other thing is, what about the prophecy in Revelation when it talks about the second coming of Jesus? Because when it, when, when it talks about the second coming of Jesus, what does it say? It says that people will go to Jesus and they will say, we prophesied in your name and we healed the sick and we did miracles in your name. These are evangelical Christians, basically. What does Jesus say to them in Revelation? He says to them, get away from me. I did not know you. I never I knew you not. Right. You know, and, and then after saying that, he quali qualifies why he condemns them, why he sends them away. And he says, you people of lawlessness. I'll see if uh, um, we can get the reference up for you. I'm on my own, so I'm having to sort of juggle around. But I can get the I can get the reference up, inshallah. Oh, brother Anis can maybe find it for me. It's in Revelation. It's about the second coming of Christ. It's about um, 
when Jesus says, get away from me. And he says, you people of lawlessness. In other words, you didn't follow the law. Now, what's the law Jesus is referring to there? Now, first of all, we have to be careful, right? Because did Jesus even say this? We can't actually say um, that Jesus actually did say this because we don't know what Jesus says, to be fair. But if they're using the paradigm that we believe that the Bible is true, that prophecy, so I think somebody's put it up there, Matthew 7.22, let's see if it is Matthew 7.22. Uh, uh, let's. I may have got it wrong. Let's have a look. Uh, 7.22. Let's have a quick look. Yeah, so that's absolutely correct. So I'll just put, that, I'll just put it up on there. I'll just put the quote onto the screen for you. And now just look at this, right? This is very profound because this is not a light rebuke. This is not something that's just light. So this is Matthew, uh, as the brother put down, um, 722. And it says, on that day, many will say to, uh, to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy, well, prophesy, prophesy sorry, in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare, this is Jesus speaking to them. I never knew you depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So and in order to in order to even do those things, you're supposed to be very good in the religion. So these are supposed to be the best of Christians. Yeah. Yeah. People who said that they prophesied in his name, they cast out demons in his name. That sounds very much like many evangelical Christians today, right? And yet, so these are people who are following uh, following the Bible, basically. They're, 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 they're Christian, clearly, right? And not only are they Christian, they are devout followers of Jesus because they're literally rushing to him and saying to him, and they are confirming their faith in him. That, you know, we believed in you, we proph prophesied in your name, we cast out demons in your name. So these are believers. These are not disbelievers from the Christian perspective, right? Now, think about the fact that he calls them, you workers of lawlessness, lawlessness, people who do not follow the law. So now ask me the question. Jesus was under the law of Moses. He was circumcised. He didn't eat pork. He didn't do any of these. Modern day Christians, everything is fair game. He prayed to the father. Jesus, people now pray to Jesus. He put his head on the floor in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, and, and uh, you know, Muslims pray in the same way. It depicts in the Old Testament Moses praying, peace, peace be upon them, the same way the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, you know, uh, they uh, prayed in the same, they all prayed in the same way. And so, so I think this is very powerful. Now, the thing is, there are many prophecies, actually, that didn't haven't come true either. So, for example, Paul, if you look at Paul, Paul is telling the people, go and sell your garments, go and sell your things. Uh, the Messiah is coming back. Don't even get married, he said. Don't even get married. He's literally on his way. It's been 2,000 years. That's what Paul prophesied. So you can't just pick the ones that seem to fit or seem to work or ones perhaps that um, things that were added in afterwards, right? Uh, and you can't ignore all of the other prophecies. And I'm going to get Ijaz actually on, mashallah, because I'm glad he's on. Uh, Sheikh Ijaz, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum as Dr. Abbas. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, you, you've, you've uh, mashallah, elevated me to doctor status. I'm very happy. Sister Tina has asked a very good question. Her mother, is it your mother, sister, who asked the question? Right. Uh, basically, she said, how comes the prophecies in Revelation are all coming true? Uh, so can you allude on that in terms of are they all coming true? And I've, I've sort of said, well, some of the references in the Bible to prophecies are actually often the earliest texts come after the event itself. So they've been sort of added in afterwards. But is is there anything else, Ijaz, with your bachelor scholarship you can add to or, or give? Zero scholarship. But basically, uh, the text of the book of Revelation is... Uh, Ijaz, your apocalypse. voice is very low. Sorry, my, my microphone is dying. Oh. No problem. I'm going to edit your mic and just turn it up. Oh, yeah, it is already turned up. Okay, mashallah. It is all the way up. Okay, let me Maybe see. Maybe just hold it near you if you can. Get it closer. I, I, I'm going to have to kiss the microphone. Oh, yeah, that's better. I hope that's this better. doesn't look weird. Yeah, that, that, 
We can't actually it's see like the mic can... anyway because it's so dark in your room. Okay, That's Hamzullah, nice. good. This is not awkward at all. Yeah, Sister Tina, basically the book of Revelation is an apocalypse, which means that even for the people in the 2nd and the 3rd century CE, in their own time, while the book was being written, they understood those references to be coming true at their time. So either it is the case that the prophecies apply to then, or they apply to now or some later point in time. The point being, however, that I think the re- the re- the so-called prophecies in the book of Revelation are quite generic. Wars and uh, wars with God's righteous people, uh, earthquakes, they're not unique things. And right. I would actually say that in the Islamic tradition, the prophecies of the end times are way more specific. Uh, they tell you when, where there's a sequence of events. They identify the parties involved. So it, it's way more specific in the Islamic tradition. I don't see anything in the book of Revelation where I would look at it and say, I feel as if this is coming true today and it's really specific in the details that it provides. If there's a particular one that your mom may be focused on, that would be better to look at. But in general, I don't think there's a single one in the book of Revelation that would merit um, such in-depth research. Yeah, I have no idea if she meant anything in particular, but I'm guessing she probably was talking about the end times and all the things that confirm in her mind that we are in the end times. This is what I'm guessing. Well, one of the things I, you know, I would put forward to your mom is, is quite simply this. If you're looking for prophecies that would confirm the truth of God, why not look at what Islam has to say about the end times and right. see which of them compared to the book of Revelation or any other book, just compare them and see the level of detail and specificity that they go into. Because on the Islamic side, we have very, very specific things. And if I'm not mistaken, um, Brother Farid the Bahraini, um, he may, has, may have posted something about this. There's like a... a, a in the Islamic tradition, it's like uh, we say it's like a, a, a chain, chain full of pebbles, one coming after the other. It's really specific. And towards the end time, it's like the, the beads of the chain just come flying out one after the other. That I don't think the book of Revelation matches it in any way. Right. No, I agree. Uh, let, let, let's give, let's give a, a, a simple example here. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that this matter, meaning Islam, will touch every household uh, that that experiences the day and that experiences the night. Every single household. So that's a very specific claim, right? I can't think of anywhere in the world where they experience their time that they don't conceive of Islam or they don't contend with Islam. Same thing with the night time. It's in every single house. Now, it would be easy to prove the Prophet, peace be upon him, false by going into a place where there is day or night time and asking them, Do you, have you ever heard of Islam? Right? The answer is going to be yes, they've heard about Islam and this matter has reached every household. That, that's something quite specific. Um, another thing that we would like to keep in mind is that the Prophet wasallam told us that the greenery would return to the Hijaz. Right? To the land of the Hijaz. So that's modern day Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, this region, you will find that the greenery has begun to return. Whether or not that's related to the climate change or not, I cannot say. No, but Ijaz, the interesting to... thing there, Ijaz, the interesting thing there is that he said it will return, indicating yeah, it that it, once it there. was there before. Yes. Now, yes. there was no indication at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, so of just course. Desert. That it was... It was just desert, right? But it's today that uh, you know geologists and uh, you know people who are experts in in these things have discovered that actually the uh, that area was very green at one time. So these are the sort of intricacies, mashallah, that the uh, you know the Quran and the Hadith Perfect. have. Sorry, Ijaz, please continue. Yeah, no, uh, that this book that's been recommended. Hey. I'll see if I can grab the link. Assalamualaikum, brothers. Oh, how are you? Alaikum, sister. How are you? Alaikum, salam. The doctor is in the house. I think I should take my leave now. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's so, his turn. So, sis, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So, sis, if anyone watching, there's this book by uh, Brother Abu Zakaria from Ayara called The Forbidden Prophecies. 
and he collects a whole bunch of these prophecies from the Quran, the prophetic Sunnah, etc., puts them all together in one place that's really accessible. And if I'm not mistaken, it may be available in Spanish as well. I could be wrong, but I know that they were translating it. So I'm going to put this book in the back chat. I think if I find an Ayera uh, stall close to you, they may actually be giving it out for free, but it's also available for free online. So I would just send it to your mom and prompt her to read it. Oh, well, absolutely. I'll definitely look it. it up. There we go. So it's oh, free. nice. You can nice, click nice. that link and it's free. Not that I'm being sponsored to promote the books or anything. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. How about we tell Dr. Imran what I was talking about? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so Doctor, um, Sister um, was saying that um, I'm getting dizzy. Uh, so stop it. Stop it. Who's doing that? Who is doing that? Ijaz, are you doing that? Lou. Okay. So we're well, certainly not me. And I know it's not Sister Tina because <laughs> she doesn't have control to do that. So stop it. Right. Sister was saying that her, her mother was basically saying, how do you explain uh, the prophecies in Revelation all coming true? So, um, you know, Ijaz has obviously given some explanations. Um, I have as well, but would you like to add anything? Uh, to, I did mention to Sister about the um, the verse in um, Matthew 7.22, where it talks about on the day when people will say to uh, Jesus, Lord, Lord, and he basically would tell them to, to go away and then give them a, the qualification of the fact that uh, there are people of, uh, of lawlessness. Uh, and that's a prophecy. So why don't Christians <laughs> think about that for a second? But uh, anyway, if you want to add anything, Doctor, to that. Uh, alhamdulillah, I think I'm fine. I think uh, you guys have mentioned the fact that that's not the statement is not correct. That the... Um... The prophecies didn't all come true in Revelation. Yes, in yes. the Old Testament. Yeah, that's the main. Didn't so true, yes. there, there are many. There are prophecies that are clear that didn't come true that were mentioned, and um, that's a problem because it's it's easy to find a confirmation biases where you find information that confirms the, the current ideas you have, but you ignore the information that goes against what you have, and really to be open and uh, a just way of approaching it is actually to look at all the information especially that which might prove you wrong. So if somebody were to say, to, so this is why, you know, the Quran, for example, you know, it says that if you can find a contradiction, you know, then this book is not from the, from Allah. And so it's actually asking you to find something to prove it to be not the case. And so if you look at the prophecies that aren't true, uh, you know, like this generation will see uh, Jesus will return before this generation, for example. It's not, that doesn't happen. Um, is that in Revelation, Doctor, or is that in another part of the Bible? Are you Revelation no. as in the book, as in everything is Revelation, or you mean the book no, Revelation? No, 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 in the book Revelation. And if, that was Paul, wasn't it, who made that is, claim? Is, that, is right? that right? Is that right, the book Revelation? That doesn't sound right. Sister Tina, did you mean the Revelation as in the Old Testament and New Testament? No, no, she meant the book of Apocalypse, because she said it in Spanish, she said Apocalypse, but when I translated it, it told me that it's to say Revelation, but no, it's the book of Apocalypse. But the apocalypse the hasn't happened book. yet. That's the last book, I think, in the Bible. But the yeah. apocalypse hasn't happened yet. So what? No, from... I know, I know, I know. But she's saying that all the all the um, prophecies in the apocalypse are all coming true. She's saying. Which ones is she referring to? She didn't mention. <laughs> she okay. didn't be because I thought I actually uh, asked her, "What do you want me to ask?" As I was on my way to work today. So this is what came out of her uh, in the spur of the moment. Uh, so we didn't really actually sit down and, you know, hash it out. Like, what exactly do you mean? Or none of that. So I just, she just threw it at me and I said, okay, I'll ask that. Okay. So the, the, I think, I think the, the claim by Paul uh, that go and sell your, sell all your things, don't even get married. Um, the, the Messiah is coming in this generation, basically. Where is that found? Is that, that's not in Revelation, is it? No, no. But that's that's a that's a problem because it's something that uh, Paul was claiming after having making the claim that he was he was visited by Jesus, peace be upon him, and given mm. this information, and he's making an incorrect statement. The other thing about the, the I would be interested to see what specific prophecies that your mum means, 
I will definitely I think, ask her. <laughs> yeah, because what you will find is probably that either they're going to be very general and non-specific, right? Um, or uh, it, and it still and it, it still doesn't explain the the even more important prophecies by maybe Jesus or Jesus upon him himself according to the the narrative, or by other people like Paul etc. That are clearly they they haven't come to pass. Um, but that's essentially what we were. You know, one of our streams that we we're doing on a Sunday was going through these uh, prophecies that were coming, and hopefully we'll recommence those at some point. And what you will see is actually this is a trend that there are many prophecies that are out there that are claimed to be prophecies, but actually they just fail. Um, but if you could find out the specific one, sister, then we can uh, maybe try to uh, understand address it, yeah. address it, yeah, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Uh, I'll definitely go over it with her more in detail. But like I said, it was just spur of the moment. First thing that came out of her mouth, and I was like, "Okay, are you sure this is what you want me to ask?" She said, "Yes." So I, I literally <laughs> yeah, so verbatim. I think, yeah. So I think what you do is, inshallah, like Imran said, ask for the specifics, and then just say to her in, in Revelation, when Jesus comes back, what do you understand with this when he says this? Or rather, sorry, not not Revelation. That was Matthew um, seven twenty two, wasn't it? So in, in Matthew seven twenty two, that's a prop. That's a that's an end of times. Uh, prophecy as well what do you what do you say about this mum what's jesus referring to it as lawlessness people right. of lawlessness what's he referring actually to in there? spanish because we don't we don't read the bible in english we always read <clears> it in <throat> spanish and there's slightly it's so nuanced that the i think that the meanings are much richer in spanish because in this particular in fact before you even posted that uh that uh verse i already knew it by heart in spanish and in Spanish, it doesn't say lawlessness. It says doers of evil, specifically. Mm. Say, get away from me, you doers of evil. Mm. It does. Are you Did you read of... uh, 2.14? Did you read uh, Revelations 2.14? Uh, I don't know what verse that was, but... Uh... So um, this is the refer reference to... The, so that on, the, on that, so this is... To, so Revelations is about the end times. And in the end times, Jesus will say to people that there are a few things that I have against you. I'm paraphrasing now. Um, there are among you people who follow or hold to the teachings of Balaam. Balaam, who taught the, uh, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites. Oh, is it up here? There we go. You have some people there who follow the teachings of Balaam, who instructed Balak to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel so they would eat food sacrificed to idols and commit sex sexual immorality so what what is being said here by jesus according to the narrative if you believe this is jesus speaking is that there are among, amongst the people who are the christians there are people who follow balaam and what they say balaam did was he turned people away from the law because the things that are mentioned there eating sacrifice to food sacrifice to idols and sexual immorality is referring to the commandments the laws that you have to follow so what what is being specifically mentioned here is that you there are people amongst you who are following someone who, like Balaam, told the people to go away from the law, because the law is specifically mentioned eating food sacrificed to idols and committing sexual immorality. And there's only one person who who really fits the bill. One person who said to the after after Balaam, if you put Balaam on side, because it's saying that there is someone who amongst you who follow the teachings of Balaam, and that would be Paul. Because Paul is the one who specifically thinks the law doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're circumcised, circumcision of the heart. you know. And then he goes on to truly preach against the, the law being applied to Christians and to Jews. Yeah, none um, of this is ever taught in the church. Yeah. That uh, Paul was a liar now, and he pretended that he wasn't teaching what he was actually teaching. And none of, nobody teaches that. Yeah. But here specifically, Jesus is saying that there are people amongst you at the end times who are following someone like Balaam. And Balaam was telling people that even now Christians don't have any dietary laws. And they're specifically, right. Jesus at the end times is mentioning dietary laws here. There right. is restriction. And they're not, uh, and I would say that it's a word of caution if you believe these are the words of Jesus based upon him to the Christians to come away from ignoring the law because this is being. Mm -hmm held up as a reason for not being uh, close to Jesus when he returns. I hope that was useful, sister. But there are other things oh, like this that we can go through, inshallah. Yeah, it's very, very useful. And um, I'll definitely go into it more in detail because I'm going to show her the video if she hasn't watched it right now. Um, and then, you know, we'll get into it. 
point by point to see if there's anything yeah, left. Yeah, and, and I think what you can do is you can lead into from this uh, issue. Uh, just what I wanted to actually ask you was that in Spanish, the sister T, uh, Tina is saying that the word is not lawlessness, but uh, doers of wicked or doers of evil or whatever. Mm-hmm. But in the Greek or the oldest manuscripts that we have, uh, what is the word and what? how is it being translated? Lawlessness. It is, law- oh, it is lawlessness. It is lawlessness. It is lawlessness. So, okay. so, so what you need to do, Tina, Sister Tina, <laughs> is you need to say to her, Mum, why have we been taught that this is word is evildoers when in fact in Greek the word directly translated actually means lawlessness and i don't know in spanish what word would you have for people who don't follow the law or are lawless there must be some equivalent word right and what you want to just ask your mum really is mum why would our bible writers not be able to translate even this word accurately what do you think is behind that and and then what you might want to do is just tie that into, and I'm sorry if this is getting complicated, but if you watch the stream back again, you'll probably be write the points down, which yeah. is that how does that then tie into the Council of Jerusalem when Paul is summoned by right. the elders and by the disciples, and they basically are, in effect, telling him off for teaching the Jews that they're no longer under the law. Right. Right? And he, and he denies it. He denies that he's doing that. And he denies it, and then they make him do the uh, Nazarai vow, right? They say that we've got two other people here, pay for them and take the vow, basically. And it, it's it's understood that he took the vow. So he sacrificed the animal, he shaved his head. Now, the interesting thing is there's, there's more problems with this because he's doing a sacrifice, animal sacrifice, apparently after the blood of Christ has already been spilt. There shouldn't be any more sacrifice in any sense, any any case anyway. But he's, he's, he's sacrificing. That's a problem now. On top of that, he's taking the vow. And, and, and what the disciples are saying, that the people have all gathered here. And so they will know it's not true. Take the, take the Nazarite vow. Confirm to them that you're not doing this. Okay. What does he do? He goes afterwards and he's, he does preach exactly what he's supposed okay. not to preach. So he knew that he was doing something seriously wrong. But I guess he figured the end justifies the means, so it's okay as long as the results are exactly what I want. Exactly. I'm guessing. Exactly. <laughs> and this is why I think it was Paul, isn't it? If I'm not mistaken, Dr. And Imran, uh, Dr. And sorry, Ijaz, where he says you can lie uh, as long as you're bringing the people to the truth. It doesn't matter. You can lie lie you can, to a Jew. You can be a, a Jew. To a Gentile, you can be a Gentile. Uh, in other words, just play along. Uh, you can deceive people, basically, uh, as long as you bring them to what he feels is the truth. And it wasn't the, the truth. It was his truth, what he thought was true. Right. So yeah, these, are, these, this, are, these are massive problems. Uh, these are massive problems. Problem. Around, sorry, Dr. Wan. We see a lot of this in different countries around the world where Christian missionaries will pretend to be something other than what they are to try and surreptitiously get into people's homes or to affect people. So they'll, uh, you know... Uh, offer to teach a language to some people and actually secretly they're getting them to learn about Christianity or they're praying with them or they're casting doubts into the children or something like this. In fact, there was a, in Africa, there were people who were building churches that looked like masjids, calling their prayer salah, dressing as Muslims, <laughs> praying oh five times a day, uh, but actually they were Christians. And so this idea of, uh, it's deceptive. I don't understand why this is necessary. Uh, but right. yeah, we see a lot of this, and it's almost systematic. Uh, and I'm going to protect us from this, inshallah. You know, I mean, inshallah. I mean. I mean. So I hope that's helped you, sister. And um, oh, a lot, a lot. <laughs> uh, but do, do it gently, though, won't you? <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> Especially, I, I've already told you guys before. I'm extra careful with my mom. If anything. I talk worse to every any. I can talk worse to anybody else, but not my mom. No, alhamdulillah, it's, it's, yeah. a, wise, it's a wise, and not only that, Islamically, of course, it's a, an obligation upon us anyway. Yeah. Uh, but that, um, I hope that helps, inshallah. Tana. And um, let her just digest this information slowly. Let her think about okay. it. I mean, look, it, it, it's so. It, as a Christian, if it, it, as a Muslim, for example, right? Let's say, for, as a Muslim, if I read an English translation. And it says, you know, the, you, you people who are wicked. 
And then I actually find out that the original word in 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 Arabic was lawlessness. That would really upset me as to why was there such a big error, big mistake? How can this just be gone going on for like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and nobody's correcting it? when it's so clear that the text says lawlessness, and then you have to ask the question, is this an accident or is this deliberate? And accident seems rather, uh, you know, a stretch. And if it's deliberate, why was it done? Well, it's clear why it, why it was done, because people are, are saying that Jesus fulfilled the law and you don't need to be under the law anymore. And therefore, this seems to imply that you are under the law. Right. And so it's clear why this corruption of, of translation is deliberate. It's because it does not want people's ears to stand up and say, hold on a second. We're supposed to be under the law. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Right. <clears throat> so it's just and, and this is this is the sort of deception that has been going on. And a, a lot of Christians, I think, are realizing this. And um, with all the academia that's coming out, those who are sort of open minded <clears throat> about these things. I don't think they're buying it anymore, to be honest. But uh, I hope that was. And helpful. every single every single version of the Bible has a different different meanings, different words. So you, how can you even tell which one is the the correct unless you you go all the way to the original Greek, which is not really the original because the no. original should have been Aramaic. Yeah, you're right, and I mean, even even like you know profound verses like first john 5 7 you know you've got the jehovah the sorry the um king james version of the bible they still have the verse in <laughs> other bibles have that verse missing because they say it, it's not been found in any of the early manuscripts before the 16th century or something it does am i right so th this is the sort of corruption that we're seeing and it's i don't believe that we can excuse it now to just uh, honest errors or honest mistakes you know th this is not on an honest mistake this is not these are not honest errors th this is a concerted effort to really pull the wool over the people's eyes it's about fooling the people and and that's and 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 this is something that those people whoever whoever have done this th they're going to have a very serious uh very very serious uh consequence you know, consequences to, to deal yeah. with absolutely yeah but i hope this has been helpful sister yes alhamdulillah thank you guys very much <laughs> i'll definitely come back with more specifics if necessary uh, uh, inshallah inshallah <laughs> all right sister jazakallah and if you're in a rush if you're in a hurry um then just email us and then we'll see if we can answer the questions quicker for you oh sure so, sure definitely yeah. all right all right sister all right alaikum. <laughs> alhamdulillah um, Dr. Mashal, you've had a lot of driving done today, so you're already tired, but Jazakallah uh, Khair for for managing to make it back. Uh, Uthman, we're going to get you on next. Uh, you can leave your camera off if you like. Uh, Uthman, welcome to the stream. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Just to let the viewers know, that is an old photograph and you are actually much older, <laughs> aren't you? I promise I took that like two weeks ago. <laughs> You took it two weeks ago, but you look much older in the video that you were. So you I'm presuming so? you're, over, you're over 18, right? Are you over 18? I'm, I'm 18. You are 18. Alhamdulillah. I'm 18. Okay. So we've qualified that for legal reasons. We don't get into trouble. Uthman, what's your question today, inshallah? Um, yeah. So we spoke uh, last time regarding one question about the preservation of the Musaf. And you did um, the 1924 nonsense, the Kira edition. And you did clear that up. Um this one, okay. First of all, do I have like a like a limit amount of questions I could ask, or, or... You, you don't? But it depends on how much detail each question okay. needs to be okay. answered. So if each if one question goes on, for example, for like twenty minutes or something, okay. um, then it might be that we might limit some of the questions. Mm -hmm. But if if they're sort of short, then you might be able to okay. squeeze a few in. But don't worry, go ahead and chat. Okay. Uh, are you guys familiar with Muhammad Ali from the Muslim Lantern? Yes. Yeah. So I emailed him regarding this. He didn't reach out yet. Um, this was, I think, two weeks ago. It's, it's another question regarding the preservation of the Musaf. So I'm going to read off this email. In, in um, the brother's defense, um, I would say sometimes he has lives of like 5,000 people watching live. <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah. 
And, and so you can imagine how many emails must be going through. So yeah. he, he probably simply hasn't been able to get through. But please go ahead and. He's uh, a young brother, like mashallah, what he's doing. May Allah bless him. He, he does I amazing, amazing work. He's, 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 I always call him, he's one of my teachers, mashallah. I learn a lot from him, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so, um, from my, and I'm reading this, from my understanding, and please correct me if what I say is inaccurate. The Mus'af was standardized after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam departed from this dunya during the lifetime of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Uthman radiallahu anhu took charge and burned any excess Quranic material that did not match with the standardized Mus'af. This is my question. Uh, why was the Mus'af standardized after so, uh, we, Prophet we Muhammad? Believe that the... I'm sorry? So, Sorry, uh, your, I didn't get audio from you. I told you to stop speaking, but it wow. just cut back in. So my apologies. Can you repeat that mm -hmm. again, the last bit? Okay, so this is what I said before. The Mus'af was standardized after Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, departed from this dunya during the lifetime of Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu. That's what I said. Okay, keep, no, you said something after what Uthman. Okay, so he's basically Uthman, saying why. Uthman, why, why Uthman took charge and burned any excess Quranic material that did not match up with the standardized Musaf because at the time people had their own things and to preserve it, anything that did not match was burned. So, so my question is that, what? Yeah, what's the question? Yeah, this is the question. Why was the Musaf standardized after Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, departed from this dunya? Uh, would it make more sense for the standardized Musaf to be verified and approved by Nabi? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa himself before he left this dunya instead of the companions. What if the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who receives proper instructions from Allah, would not approve this standardization? So, yes. so the Quran as we recite today, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded us to be upon the sunnah of himself and his companions. Mm -hmm. So whatever his companions understood to be from his sunnah, we accept as his sunnah. So in this mm -hmm. case, the companions authentically repeat his reading of the Qur'an, what he has permitted as the reading of the Qur'an. And among the companions, we accept two statements. The first is that the Qur'an was revealed in many modes, in many uh, uh, ways. And then at some point, the Prophet ﷺ gave permission to specific people, specific groups and specific students to recite in ways that he authorized. So what we recite today, there is no contest, no doubt about it, is from the command of Rasulullah wasallam. So the companions could not have invented or made a change to anything which he transmitted to them because they agreed in unison that this is what the Prophet wasallam had permitted and taught himself. So there is no dispute uh, about this among the Sahaba. There is only one dispute, and this was about the person who is meant to lead the scribal project after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And th this comes down just to Ibn Masud radiallahu an, and its difference with the the, the the scribe of the revelation. That's it. Nothing beyond that. And in any case, I think in four of the seven main kiraats. We have the recitation of Ibn Mas'ud as a teacher in those Asanid. Um, mm -hmm. What I would follow up from saying is that we don't believe that they burnt manuscripts that merely differed. We mm -hmm. say that they burnt the manuscripts that differed with the consensus and were, which were not written according to the standard agreed upon by the companions. Because what we mean by the writing standard is how you represent the spoken word in a written form. So you have to develop a standard or a convention that the people agree this is how we spell a spoken word. And there were already several conventions in use. The companions simply systematized that standard and they propagated it throughout wherever they sent their students. So... It makes sense that this occurred after the Prophet wasallam, because in the time of Abu Bakr to the time of Uthman anhum, the Ummah expanded significantly. And mm -hmm. the ways in which the Quran was permitted to be cited 
reached the different lands all the way up into Azerbaijan. Ha, uh, that's where I'm born. Arabia. That's where I'm born. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. So you know how far away you are from the Hijaz. So yeah. the Ummah expanded significantly. And different groups, different regions had different teachers. Same Quran, just different mode of recitation. And so alhamdulillah, after the Ummah had expanded so significantly, and the companions took the prophetic sunnah so far, the companions decided upon a method of of uh, writing the recited word in a way that would be adopted by the majority of the ummah and today that's still the standard so we know that they were successful in what they intended because the standard has remained the same right so alhamdulillah mm -hmm. and the quran has been preserved through it so there is no dispute here there was just one point which is that um, they didn't simply burn anything that differed what they would do is they would correct the manuscripts with the standard of the, the conventional writing system that he had agreed upon so that no one can change the meaning or that no one can change the recitation for themselves. The Quran must be mutawatu by definition. And so whatever manuscripts could be amended or corrected or witnessed properly, no problem with that. But anything that you couldn't change, anything that you couldn't amend, if you etched it into stone, if you wrote it on papyrus, those are not things which can be changed. You could only get rid of them by one way, one of two ways, uh, either by fire or in a stream of running water or by burial, right? Mm -hmm. But typically they did it by burning because that was the main method for papyri. Mm -hmm. But that's about it. Okay. So if I went on for too long, I might forgive me. No, no, that's fine. I think there's a couple of other issues here. I've just put a video up, actually, for people who are interested. Uh, this is on the channel Towards Eternity. And they've got, mashallah, a, a famous translator on there. Uh, and he explains about the beauty of the qiraat and how the different modes and the different qiraat and how they complement uh, each other and how they expand on the meaning. Now, the, the couple of questions that you asked, the, the first question or one of the questions that you asked was, why was this not done at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Now, if you understand why the modes were revealed in the first place, you wouldn't have asked that question. Of course, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not upset with you for asking it. I'm just sort of explaining to you. Because mm -hmm. the modes were revealed because the Prophet, peace be upon him, himself asked Jibreel alayhi salam and, give it, and recite it in another way and recite it in another way. And then we have a hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, saying that he recited it to me in seven different uh, modes. Now, the reason for this was because the Arabs had different dialects. Now, if I go up north to Yorkshire, in Yorkshire, people will say to me things like, do you want a lake? Do you understand what that means, Uthman? Can we be the, do, I, do I want a lake? Do you want a lake? Do I want a lake? No, I don't understand it. Okay. That means, do you want to play in London? Hmm. That's how they, well. In Yorkshire, their terms for certain things commonly used are different. Now, of course, they would understand, do you want to play as well? Because now we have fast communication, we have television, radio, we have media, all these sort of things. So people are aware of the different dialects and they can often speak each other's dialect. Now, that wasn't the case at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So now, however, when the Quran is revealed in the seven uh, different modes and it's being used by the different people and they can fully access the Quran as a consequence, the, it, the Quran then started to spread outside of the Arabian Peninsula. Do you understand my point, Uthman? Yes, yes. Those people didn't need this, the, the different aruf. They did not need the different modes. One standardized version would be sufficient for non-Arab speaking people because now they can access. The, in fact, it would have made it more complicated had you had a mass transmission of the seven different modes 
Uh, it would have made things for non-Arab speaking people more confusing. And we have the incident, the famous incident where um, two um, people are arguing that I read it this way and you read it this way. And then, then he comes back to Uthman and he says, look, uh, there's this issue where they're, even though they might be reciting it accurately, but because they're reciting it within the different modes, the different uh, aruf, the different um, qirat, right? They might get confused and I fear that there might be a problem. And so Uthman then re realized that, of course, because the Prophet said, take of any of them, mm -hmm. any of them are sufficient for you. There was no need to take all of them. So they were just following the Prophet, peace be on him's uh, uh, teachings. Mm -hmm. And 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 um, Uthman standardized it, and of course, remember when uh, Ijaz explained as well. People had their personal copies. Okay, yes. if I write the word, I know you are here. The word no, I'm going to spell it K N O W, right? K K O. No. No. Right, K N O W. No, yes. Oh no, no. But you can spell no as in just N-O, but it means something different, right? Yes, yes. So some of the companions had their personal copies. They would spell the name. They would spell it. The sound would be exactly the same, but they would have their own spelling, what was easy for them. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what Uthman did, mashallah, in his wisdom is he standardized it so there would be no confusion. Um, there would be no confusion left. Today, the 10 accepted qirat which, which come from the, the the seven aruf these are widely recognized to be traceable right back to the prophet peace be upon him and in fact we have people today who can recite all of them as well subhanallah right the the other thing to remember here is that there's no we, we're, we're talking about abu bakr radiallahu anhu his khilafa lasted two years Umar Khattab, his khilafah was, I think, eight years. Was it, doctor? Eight years or 12 years? It was eight, eight or 12 years, very short. So we're talking about within 20 years, within the life of the companions who had memorized, mass memorized the Quran, and they all agreed, this is the Quran. Mm -hmm. And we have that chain of memorizers even today, which is known as Ijaza, which goes right back to the very companions who memorized it directly from Rasulullah. The last component is if there were any major problems in preservation, you would not conceivably see today people reciting the Qur'an and correcting one another directly from memory without even looking into the mushaf. Mm -hmm. yes. the, the, me the mechanism of being able to do that, a child in Kenya can correct a child in China if he's reading the Qur'an without looking into the book. <laughs> mm -hmm. That shows you that there had to be a robust system. Now, this system of preservation is even recorded in non-Muslim academia who have argued, like Professor Angelica Newith, that it's an early fixed text. There isn't this problem about the text being preserved, basically. Yeah. These are non-Muslim academics. So I think there really there is there's no doubt about mm -hmm. preservation. And I think really, um, even if you look at the words of P Professor Angelica Newith, she, she argues that the discussion for preservation is over. Because the, the number of manuscripts and the number of uh, confirmations to the preservation are so profound that there is no longer really any conceivable argument. What's her but, name? Sorry? The scholar's name? You Professor, Professor Angelica Neweth no, from Germany. Yeah. I'll see if I can get her essay article up on the screen, inshallah. But doctor, if you want to add anything, please do. Uh, no, Alhamdulillah, I think you covered it. Your Ajaz as mashallah, and then yourself as well. And just to clarify, there were two gatherings of the Quran, one by Abu Bakr, and the second one was by uh, Uthman. Dhalan. So the one by Abu Bakr was within two years of the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the second one was done um, uh, at the time mm -hmm. of uh, Uthman. 
-hmm. and all and both times this was the companions gathering the Quran from those who had uh, written the Quran, the, the text down in the presence of the Prophet peace be upon him, and he had verified that with one witness of that happening. So the Quran, the collection of the Quran was a communal communal project, and the companions agreed that this was the Quran from the Prophet peace be upon him. Unlike any, firstly, unlike any other religious text, which has been in the hands of the elite few and not amongst the masses, the Quran from the beginning was recited and recorded by the people, um, and it was in the hands of the people from the beginning. So it's a very interesting look, but hopefully that's been useful for you, inshallah, brother um, um, Othman. And then we'll leave the link for the Angelica New Earth article in the chat for everyone to look at, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Oh, what's that? Uh, the Quran. Let me see. Uh, the Quran. It just says the Quran. Is that the title? You're on mute. <laughs> You're muted. Um, it's edited by uh, Jane uh, Damon uh, Muc Muc McAuliffe. Uh, and basically it's Cambridge uh, Companion to the to the Quran, Cambridge Companion to the Quran. There's an article in this um, by Angelica Newith. Um, basically, I'll see if I can pull out the exact um, reference and put it up on the screen when I've got a bit of time, inshallah. But basically, there's, there's, there's lots of other people who've confirmed what I'm, I'm saying. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's really... Um, can I ask you, though, um, where did you get this... Um, where did you get this question from? Uh, okay, mm -hmm. basically, and I don't recommend the youngsters to do this, unfortunately. Uh, I, I'm I used to be on Instagram. I deleted it for you know for the sake of my man, my faith. But uh, this anti-Islamic uh, Instagram page that would like promote like Christian like missionaries, Islamophobes, like Ejaz has talked to one of them, I believe like clips of them and one of them was Nabil Qureshi who passed away the uh the Ahmadi who became Christian and he you know brought up the discussion of the president of the Mustaf how it wasn't how two of the companions had 116 chapters and another had 112 chapters um yeah fake news at first emotionally it shook my faith obviously because you're ignorant but Nonetheless, I'm like, I will always ask the people of knowledge. I'm not going to listen to these people who lie about my book. I mean, how disingenuous are you to say Surah 9 verse 5 is a violent verse, but if you just read the four verses before that, it clears up and it gives you the context. So I obviously don't trust these people, you know? So that, and then these questions <laughs> just pop up. I do my research, but then... When I do my research, sometimes I come up with websites that confirm what they say, and I don't like that. I like to go directly to people well, and ask. I, I've never come across a website that confirms anything a missionary tells me. That way what? That I've never come across a website that confirms anything a missionary has told me. I mean, like websites like, for example, Answering Islam or Christian, like Christian highly, websites. The, the yeah, live highly thing. On, I'll tell you a secret, right? When I can't remember the ayah for an argument or something, I'll just Google it and I could depend on answer in Islam to give me the, uh, the reference for the correct ayah or something like this, right? But uh, here, here's the thing. They will never be pleased with you as a Muslim and their arguments are always essentially self-defeating. Mm -hmm. Simply because... Some of them argue that the Prophet wasallam never existed and at the same time they argue that he was a biblically immoral man who needed nothing as immoral as the biblical prophets. So a lot of these claims and arguments are simply not convincing whatsoever. Especially yeah. this one about 116 surahs versus 112. By definition, the Quran is mutawatir. We don't have a single report of a sahaba reliable, authentic, well-transmitted report of a single Sahabi popping up to a masjid and saying, all right, guys, I got a new one. It's just never happened, right? And I want you to think about today the practical example of someone coming to your masjid and telling the local imam, 
yo, yo, chill. For Jumrah, I got this. I got this. And he starts reciting something you've never heard before. What would happen? Just, let me ask you, what, what would happen to that person? He would get kicked out. <laughs> how instantly, right? You can't even go to the masjid and the imam, the, I would say, you know, makes a different choice in terms of tajweed and someone will correct him. Much less an entire... Yeah, guys, I'm sorry about the volume. The microphone is... I can't explain to you. I'm holding it in my hands right now. It, you can kind of see it there. It's dying. It's on its, it's last blue. legs. Uh, uh, just never buy the blue brand. It seems to be terrible. Um, uh, yeah, so in sum, I would always doubt whatever a missionary tells me by default. By default. So it's good that you know to stay away from the Shubuhat. May Allah protect you and preserve Amen. you from it. Amen. I mean, but it's easy to fall into the trap because misinformation is their game. Right? As yeah. long as they can misinform you. Here's the thing. People tend to believe whatever they're first exposed to. So even though a person might get a sound and proper refutation of a false idea, simply because that false idea was presented to them first in sequence, they will tend to lean towards it. So keep, keep your mind on that, inshallah. This is what they would try to do to you. Feed you bits of misinformation to touch everything about Islam. But don't let them do that because they're shy at you, quite simply. Yeah, yeah. You know, every time it happens, I just say, I'm ignorant, but I will, you know, ask the correct people. Like the, the, the 160, 112 argument that really hurt me. Um, but I did go on Dawa over Dunya and I asked them. It was just, you know, one person had the what written on it. It was lies, basically, you know. Yeah, and I mean, the thing is, you know, uh, Uthman, I always say to people, do not go to people who are insincere and are even prepared to lie in order to try to make a point. Go go to people who are academics, who have no dog in the race. They don't have, <clears throat> you know, they're not biased either way. And of course, some of them still get it wrong, but we can challenge them on ba on the basis of the evidences that they provide and the counter evidences for their claims. And the problem with these people is that when we have, as Muslims, we've approached some of these websites and we've given them the answers, we've told them that what you've said is manifestly wrong because here's the evidence. You know what they've said to us? Yeah. What we're, gonna, we're, we're going to still leave it on there and let the people decide. They they said that to you? Wallahi, this is what they said. So there are Some many, not, not, not me personally, we have um, um, Islam, um, uh, what, what is the website? Uh, Islamic Awareness and the brothers there and there's answering Christians. And when they've basically gone back and they've said, look, this is, this is what you've, what you've done is a, is, is a lie, is basically, this is wrong. They have said they're going to still leave it on there and let the people decide. And so this shows an insincerity and it shows that even if something is wrong, they're prepared to keep it on there. No, because, no. you know, the pro because look, here's, here's the issue, you see. If they're prepared to lie to their own people about their own book, then it's easy to lie about the Quran then, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. If you're prepared to lie about the Bible being preserved, uh, being accurate, being the word of God, when actually the evidence is completely against all of those claims, then basically you're prepared to you're going to be prepared to lie about the Quran. So don't go to insincere people to learn your religion. That's what I I'm promise saying. they come to me. I didn't do anything. They followed me on Instagram and then they DM me. I blocked them. I promise. I just I don't I didn't respond. Yeah. I just just, just just tell them, come to EF Dawa, come to uh, a Muslim Lantern, and, and why don't you go and ask them your questions there if you are truthful yes. Yes. and if you're honest. You know, that's what I would advise them to Thank do. Thank you. Thank you for that yeah. question. And, um, All right, Usman, do you have another quick question? Yeah, I have one one more, and then I, I'll leave. Um, this is regarding Ibn Ishaq. Uh, I got this question from my discussions with Christians. I noticed they would bring up Ibn Ishaq, Surah Rasulullah a lot. And then I watched um, Ijaz's discussion with another person two years ago. And he kept, I'm not going to say his name, but he kept bringing up Ibn Ishaq, Surah Rasulullah to uh, to like confirm the Gospel of John. And a lot of Christians, and I didn't know who, who how they got this argument from. They, it has to be from someone. And then when I watched this interview, 
with uh, Ijaz and this person. I'm like, this is where they got it from. And it was basically uh, Ibn Ishaq confirming the Gospel of John. So how would I respond to this? It would it be, because I, I say to them, listen, he's not our authority. It's the Quran and the Hadith. And if these two, if it's not there, we don't care what a third party says. Um, so I want to know if what I'm saying is accurate to these people. So in general, Ibn Ishaq, right? Ibn Ishaq. Sorry. Yeah, does not uh, uh, he does not authenticate the gospels. He collects riwayat, sayings and traditions of the people in his own time and place, and then he sorts them sometimes chronologically according to the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he leaves it for further evaluation, and he says this in the introduction to his seerah, right? So we don't simply take from his seerah and consider it authentic because he has recorded it. We mm -hmm. don't do this and it's not part of our tradition. And you would not find the scholars doing so. And you are correct. Even if, let's grant the, the argument for the sake of the argument, even if Ibn Ishaq did this, is there a consensus on this? Did a Sahabi say this? Is there an author from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? There was nothing from him on this. Uh, that, that would authenticate the Gospel of John. There was nothing from the companions that would do so. So mm -hmm. we can reject the mere opinion and speculation of someone, regardless of how early they go back into the tradition, unless it is something that the companions agreed upon. Right? That's our standard. So in any case, yes, Ibn Ishaq does not say that. And he tells you to verify and validate what he has collected. This is the important thing. So anyone who has a primary evidence goes to quote Ibn Ishaq, does not understand the genre of work that he's done, does not understand how the work is meant to be used, and does not understand the role of that work in the Islamic intellectual tradition. So I would consider anyone who does so an intellectual dwarf, simply. So they're an ignoramus, not someone to be contended with. You guys can I ask you a question. Um, sure. Forget what Ibn Ishaq has said on the matter. Do the Christian scholars themselves confirm the gospel? No, they they don't. And just just to point one thing out, right? To anyone who brings this argument to you, brother Uthman, do you mm -hmm. know uh, Surat Al Baqarah? Uh, yeah, I read it in English right. recently. So, yeah. Right, right. So the, the second ayah says that that is the book in which there is no doubt. Referring mm -hmm. to the Quran, correct? Yes, I read that. Okay, so I had two columns, two columns. Books mm -hmm. that are in doubt in one column and mm -hmm. books that are not in doubt in the second column, where would the Quran go? To the, book that, the books that are not in doubt. doubt. Not in doubt. And where yeah. would any other book go? Uh, the ones in doubt. Exactly, because the Quran tells you that in the very second ayah of it, right? Of mm -hmm. yes. So it makes it simple for us and it's something that they tend to overlook. I, I just put the question back to you. I've mm -hmm. ever seen a companion cite any of the four Gospels and given a, a, a fiqh ruling, for example? Uh, not that I know of. No. I, no. If it was a legitimate source of revelation and this was believed by the companions, even if it was abrogated, even if there was the changes to it, they would have referenced it in some way for context in the same way that they tend to do the Israeliyat, right? Mm -hmm. But they don't seem to do this with any of the four Gospels. So it's a proof against them that they don't know what they were speaking about. Yeah. I leave it at that. Uh, Jordan or Imran, do you want to add anything to that at all? Assalamualaikum, Jordan. Lovely to see you. You okay? Yeah, I'm only good to the brothers. Alhamdulillah. My mic okay? Yeah, Alhamdulillah. Your mic's pretty good. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Your, your mic uh, is very good. I think you've taken all the power from Ijaz. <laughs> we need to give some back to Ijaz. He took the power. I haven't got the green screen well. yet. Yes. I need Ijaz's green screen. <laughs> no, you're back that's, on. That's a fake green screen. Fake green screen. <laughs> Was it real? I can't tell. I can't tell. No, you're definitely not real. <laughs> uh, brother Ijaz, uh, last quick question. Um, when I watched the discussion with that person, um, you did mention in the hadith 
there is a hadith that said from I believe from Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him that what the what the Christians possess is on authentic in authentic. Can I do you have like the reference for it or the hadith? I honestly cannot recall. If you send me an email, I can pursue it with you, inshallah. But generally, the Prophet وسلم, did not authenticate the books of the Christians and the Jews and tell us to read from them. So it, that, that's simply it. If I did mention a narration, I will probably have a reference for it. So send yeah. me an email and I'll check it, inshallah, for you. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you so much, brothers. Thank you All so right, much. brother. I hope that's been All helpful for you. If I took too much time, but thank you. May Allah bless you guys. And uh, <laughs> khair, brother. Okay, guys, backstage, if you have your cameras on, you'll get on quicker. Um, and by putting your camera on, I just need you to put your – give me a thumbs up, Jackson, if that's okay. That's lovely. We're going to get you on next, Jackson. Uh, you can leave your camera off or turn it on, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, Jackson, welcome to the stream. Assalamu alaikum, brothers. Wa alaikum assalam, brother. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I do have a quick question for you guys, though. I do appreciate you guys getting on here, too, with all of your knowledge. Um, no, no, inshallah. Please go ahead, brother. I was speaking to some Christian ladies last weekend. And I guess they were they were being missionaries. I knew one lady from a mutual friend. And then I, when I went and spoke to her, she got me to sit down and they all kind of ganged up on me because they wanted to invite me to their church. And I let them know that I was Muslim. And it blows my mind how much just from being a new revert. I mean, I've been Muslim for for one year now. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And I've been learning so much not only about Islam, but also about Christianity, because we, we have to deal with a lot of uh, things that we hear from Christianity, considering that that is a previous faith amongst the, the Abrahamic religions. And they mentioned one thing to me that didn't necessarily have me stuck, but it did make me curious. They mentioned that they believe that, that Jesus had to die, which I know we don't believe that, but they believe he had to die because God can't look at sin and they believe in the original sin. And I let them know we don't really believe in the original sin. However, they said something that 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 kind of intrigued me. They said that the prophets before they made sacrifices. So Jesus wasn't the only sacrifice. They said Moses and all of the other prophets made sacrifices. And I did see that in the Bible about them making sacrifices. I'm not sure if we believe that in the Quran or not. So I wanted to, to ask some people about that, but I did see that they did make animal sacrifices before and they no longer do that. Even the Jews believe that, that they made animal sacrifices. So I'm curious about that. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Um, doctor, did you, did you hear the question? Do you want to go first or shall I go first? Inshallah. You're muted, Doctor. You're just muted. Sorry, brother. Welcome to the stream. I, I think I caught the end of your question. Um, I just um, interesting that they were trying to gang up on you and get you to go to their church. Um, there's a problem. Um, the problem is we're not talking about animal sacrifices. We're talking about a human sacrifice. Hmm. And a human sacrifice is specifically prohibited in the Old Testament. In fact, it's, it says that um, the, look at, looking at the ways of the pagans around you who sacrifice their children. And mm -hmm. yet we're attributing to God the idea that he would sacrifice his own son. Um, but that's one thing, that's just, just a thought that came into my head. So it's not, a, it's not even the same thing. The right. second thing is it's not true. In the Old Testament, you have um, a variety of different types of sacrifices. Um and the ones that are animal sacrifices specifically, so the ones that are mentioned in Leviticus, are all for a specific type of thing, mm -hmm. which is unintentional sin. Mm. Unintentional sin. Okay. So that's not, it's not for, so this is why that if you look at, you can read the Old Testament, there is no uh, sin sacrifice for like stealing or for rape or mm -hmm. for murder. There isn't any. Right. It is for those, it's, so what the sacrifices are for are for those sins that are done un unintentionally 
And then what would happen is that the priest would carry out a sacrifice for God to forgive them. Um, now, it's interesting, it's interesting that that's nothing to do with sin, it's, uh, uh, intentional sin. It's to do with things that you didn't know that you'd done. Mm. Do you understand? So there is, and if you, if, and there are, and amongst the sacrifices, it could be anything. If you had, if you couldn't afford an animal, cat, uh, you know, you could give some flour even. It wouldn't matter. Do you understand? So if, if, what they're doing is they're conflating the system of having sacrifice for unintentional sin with um, the, 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 the system that's been bought by, uh, you know, the by the Christians. Mm -hmm. Now, what what is the main issue with that? The main issue with that is um, that the, the concept is that the only way for your sins to be forgiven mm -hmm. is if God has a sacrifice. He, otherwise, he cannot forgive. No, it's even worse. Sin cannot be forgiven. It has to be paid for with a sacrifice. So what you do in that, by insisting that God has to pay for uh, or someone has to pay God for the sin that was done, it has to be paid for. You're taking away God's God's uh, attribute of being forgiving, because who are you forgiving? And I'll give you an example of this: is if you're if you this is always the boss who owes money. Yeah? So if a boss owes you some money, right, and uh, you forgive him, does he have to pay you? If I forgive him, no. Okay. If a boss owes you some money, and uh, he pays you. Did you forgive him? I will feel like okay, you paid me back. Yeah, I forgive you. We're even now. But yeah, so you've got your money. You've got your money though, because forgiveness is actually not. If you forgive someone, there's no need for payment. Now, like if yeah. if a bus owed you money and then Jordan paid you, did you forgive a bus? If Jordan pays me, did I forgive the boss? Did you did you forgive the bus? I would still feel like the boss didn't take care of his business. Like he was yeah, supposed to pay me back. He didn't do what he was supposed to so do. So in both those examples, there's no forgiveness. So in the crucifixion, Jesus dying for the sins of everybody, according to the Christian theology, there's no forgiveness in this transaction. God cannot forgive sin. He needs his money. He needs his blood. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that uh, that's, not a, that's not taught by... So Jews don't believe in original sin. So Jews do not believe in original sin. Why did they need sacrifice just for unintentional sins? For, so it was fine. So, for example, if you if say if there was somebody who had walked through the temple, and their mm -hmm. and their feet were under, uh, dirty or unclean, but they didn't realize this, yeah. So this would be an unintentional sin. What would then happen is that they the the priest would carry out a a sacrifice just. So I'll give an example, a similar example. So you know zakat, right? Zakat, yes. So what is zakat? What did you know it's, what that means? It's a charity, and it's a, it's our obligated charity. I'm not sure the specific meaning, but yeah. So it's it's it means it, it basically means to purify. Okay. So what are we purifying? I don't know our souls. We're purifying our fund, our money. Uh, so if if in our in in our in our year in our year what we've done is we've maybe inadvertently done something incorrect or we've sort of not quite done a deal as we said we would or this it, we give we give our, this mandatory charity which belongs to the poor it's given and it purifies our wealth from any wrongdoing that may have accidentally happened within that un unintentionally mm, okay similar, that makes similar, a lot of sense similar so let me what i'm going to do is just levic i've got just levit leviticus leviticus open i've got a somebody gave me a, a king of shame so i'm going to read it from the king of shame but i'm going to give you just give you four little verses from this this is chapter 4 verse 2 uh, if a soul sins through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning the things which ought not to be done and shall do against any of them so this so this is the first category the priest shall then uh, do a, uh, uh, is anointed to do sin according to the sin of the people and let him bring forth his sin which he hath sinned a young bullock so this is unintentional sin this is the first one yeah? then we go to uh, verse 13 uh, if the whole congregation of Israel sins through ignorance and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly and they have done something against the commandments of the Lord. Again, this is talking about unintentional sin. If you go to verse 22, and when the ruler has sinned and done somewhat through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord, again, unintentional sin. And then if you go to verse 27, and if any one of the common people sin through ignorance 
whilst he doeth something against any of the Lord's command. So this is all about unintentional sin. And what chapter is that? This is Leviticus 4. This is the really all about, the whole thing is about the, the laws of the sacrifice. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you, if you, uh, if it says, uh, if you're talking about um, the people who, intentional sin, then that's a different, you have to ask the question, what about someone who sins intentionally? No, no sin sacrifice mentioned for intentional sin. None. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so the so what they've done is they've taken so the idea of so are there are there pagan myth, uh, theologies or mythologies of God having to kill His Son to save mankind? Soteriology is called. Yeah, yeah. There's loads of them. There's at least sixteen other pagan concepts that predate Christianity about God having uh, to to kill His Son uh, for the for mankind. Wow, and what they've done is they've and where was this? This is prominent throughout Rome. So in Rome there was the what was the what was the god Mithras, who was the god in, in Rome, who sacri who's birth who's born on the twenty fifth of December, and he's uh, they, they, they use they sacrifice a bull for him uh, on the twenty fifth of December. It's it's basically the pagan story uh, or the, the theology of Christianity, which is where it's taking it from. But there's loads of other places. And what you have is uh, th this Roman, this Hellenized uh, idea. So when Paul was going into uh, Rome and these areas, you see all these people had these pagan views. He they basically amalgamated them into Christianity, into into this early Christian, and they, and they joined them together. Mm -hmm. And this is why the what's Easter? Easter is the is the celebration of the birth of the the the, the goddess Eos. The day the day that God rose. Absolutely. The day that well, Jesus rose. Absolutely. Now, the prob problem here is, is that it's the pagan festival. Easter is a pagan. It was from the, the god Eosta. And then there was, uh, then you have the, the 25th of December. Where was that from? This is the birth of the pagan god Mithras. In fact, there's many 25th of Decembers. Because 25th of December is the, is the solstice. It's the when the, the, the sun is getting less and less and less and less and less is dying. Yeah. And then the sun is, is starts to, the sun is then born again. Right? The days start to get longer. And that's the 25th of December. So that's become the, they put it birthday of Jesus, beauty upon him. But it doesn't make sense because there were shepherds in the in the fields, apparently. And obviously in December, it's covered in snow. So there wouldn't have been sheep, shepherds in the field. You know, it did none of the story makes. So they just allocated that as the birthday. And Easter is the celebration of spring. I either, you know, everything comes back to life. All of the dead things that died over the summer and the winter, sorry, they come back to life. And so they've just made that pagan festival. This is you know, the rebirth of Jesus. They just combine this pagan festival into this. Right. So, so the there's theology nothing, of God, nothing, to do, nothing to do with any of it. These are yeah. pagan festivals that have been adopted and brought into Christianity because that's where the origins wow. are. The original sin. And then Jews don't yeah, make sense. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last part that you said. What was that? Well, about what? Sorry. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jackson, sorry, what was it you didn't catch? I can no longer. Can you hear us? I'm sorry. We can hear you, Jackson. Uh, can you hear can us you now? Hear me? We can hear you, but can you hear us? I cannot hear you. Okay, yeah, I think maybe I mean, your speakers have come out or something, or your headphones. Yeah, maybe if he comes out of the stream and then comes back in again, but you obviously won't hear us saying that. So maybe we can put it in the private chat or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, could be his headphones, could be batteries, it could be all sorts of things. Um, yeah. So Jackson, look, if you're hearing the stream afterwards, um, <laughs> it, you know, just even if you look at, for example, God was never called God, and Jesus was never called Jesus. So, you know, even the names have been changed. I mean, it's just shocking. But I think he's going to try to come back in again. Mm -hmm. uh, Cosmic, if you want to come on, please have your camera on. And by the way, if you, if anybody else would like to join the stream, um, just give me a wave, Cosmic, please. That's lovely. I want to see if I can get Jackson back on again. Brother Jackson, can you hear us? I can hear you perfectly. Oh, no, I'm I'm sure I'm so, Doctor, before. please finish what okay, you were saying. Sorry, so, Jackson, you said you didn't hear something. What was it that you didn't hear? Do you remember? Um, 
Well, when I came back, it looked like you were done talking as if you asked me a question. So I wasn't sure if you if you asked me anything. All I was saying end. that was so there's a lot of pagan theology that has been sort of incorporated into into Christian beliefs. OK, the Jews, Jews don't believe in uh, original sin. That was, that's something new. I didn't know that. Yeah. The, so the Jews don't believe in original sin. This idea that um, um, that God would somehow blame all of people for the death of for the sin of an individual it's it doesn't it's it's not, it's not just is it why would you be blamed for what your grandfather did jackson right but then to attribute that to god and then at the same time call god loving and merciful it doesn't make sense and if if you're and if you compare the chronic narrative of the original sin with uh, with original forgiveness what happens in islam is when adam and eve they eat from the fruit they're forgiven allah teaches them how to seek repentance they repent to allah and allah forgives them there's no original sin in Islam. Yeah. So you now contrast in terms of if you had a child and you cared about them and you claim to love them, they make an error, they make a mistake, you teach them, you don't cut them right. off. Exactly. And this is what we have. And then the only way to get better is not, you can't do anything. I've got to send a, someone I care about and you've got to kill them brutally to pay me. It's just so really they, believe, they believe that, that everyone before didn't make it to heaven unless they sacrificed an animal up until the no, no. Jesus. Is that what they believe? Or so what? So what happens is that uh, the Jews had a system of uh, animal sacrifice for unintentional sin. Right, I understood that, but I mean, like yeah. what Christians today, what they usually, what you usually get from them is that they believe that that everyone before Jesus they they went to hell unless they sacrificed. So, so to be fair, because um, because obviously now I'm speaking on behalf of, and there's a variety of beliefs, but the the concept that I understand that most Christians, when I speak to them, say to me is, and it's worth checking with them because I don't want to misrepresent them, right. is that the 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 animal sacrificial system that they believe that was used, and I mean I I, I explain to you why I disagree with them that they believe that was used, was uh, a partial covering of their sins until the big sacrifice of Jesus on the cross came. Ah, okay. So it sort of was like a it, it would do, but it wasn't enough until Jesus was the one that was killed, and then it covered everything, uh, which is odd, really. I mean, if uh, imagine, I uh, just it means that, like I said to you, it means that God cannot forgive sin if He has to be right. paid. It just takes away forgiveness as an attribute. Right. Hope that makes sense. So yes, they did say that there is sacrifice in the Old Testament, but it's not as they're representing it to you. It's for unintentional sin. So just okay. read the chapter of Leviticus 4 and you'll see. Inshallah. I'll do that. And also, that. Jackson, what's very interesting is that the reason why the Jews denied uh, Jesus was because of the claim that he was crucified. <laughs> because crucifixion was a humiliation and their prophecy that they had for the coming of the Messiah was not that he was going to be killed and crucified. And that's, in fact, why they denied him. So this is, there's so many problems there. And the other thing is that, can you imagine the lack of preservation where even the names have been changed? So Jesus was never called Jesus. If you, if, if, if you saw Jesus 2,000 years ago and you said, Jesus, Jesus, he wouldn't turn around. Right, right. Because that wasn't his name. But and it wasn't he, it wasn't Isa either, right? What well, we believe that's well, not the Isa Aramaic. is the Arabic uh, way of saying it. Esau, right. Isa. This is, but what I'm trying to say to you is, it certainly wasn't Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see, and and you know, in many languages they have a, a an issue and a problem where they add letters to. So in in my um, when my family come from in Gujarat, they add a H in front of a lot of words. Right. So, for example, um, if uh, you have somebody from my parents' area, they'll say suche, which means what, you know, what is it? And if you go slightly in a slightly different place, they'll say hunche, they'll add a H to it, mm, right? right? And in the same way, Isa, you know, G Isis or whatever, Isa, they added a J, G, and they made it Jesus, so what I'm trying to say to you is that they didn't even they didn't even preserve the name of Jesus or preserve the name of God. Jesus never said God. Right. Jesus said, well, he spoke Aramaic, so he said yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what I'm trying to explain to you is that even the the, the 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 least of the things that you'd expect preserved. I mean, for example, if I was quoting Jackson said this, and suddenly I change your name Jackson to uh, I don't know Harold. 
I mean, you know, people would say, why, why have you not even <laughs> preserved his name? Right, right. If you can't even preserve a name, how are you claiming you've preserved what he said? Right, mm. right, right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Jordan, when you were obviously looking into Islam and um, I'm, I'm, and obviously I'm, from it being in England, obviously Christianity tends to be like the default, you know, even if you're not following it or you're not fully believing it. But did you encounter any of these issues or problems when you were looking into comparative yeah. religion? Interestingly, the, um, uh, the the original sin was actually one of my big issues with um, with Christianity. This this unjust, as Imran said, um, this notion that we are born with sin and we have to you know pay it. We need a blood sacrifice to pay things off. And um, and I think you actually pointed me in my early days, Abbas, towards a, a verse in the um, New Testament, Ezekiel eighteen twenty, which actually actually agrees with the Quranic notion of original sin. So I don't know if you know Jackson, Ezekiel 1820, but if I read it, it's very short. It says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. Mm. Uh, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. So it's quite clear even in the New Testament that um, that we are responsible for our own sins, right? We're not responsible for people finding us. So if, if, if those group, I'm not, I'm no expert on Christianity, but if those group of Christians came up to me, I'd love to them to explain that to me before I went any further with them. And I think doesn't it doesn't it say further when you read further that if the uh, if the um, sinner turns away from their sin, yeah, the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if you if you move, I think but Even what's further, the, but, so, yeah. Uh, so that would be eighteen twenty one, probably. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so yeah, go it does say, does say that if you if if someone has sinned and they turn away from their sin, they shall surely live. They will not so oh, yeah. describe the fact that when you even if you are a sinner and you repent and you turn back to God, mm. then your sins are, are, are wiped away. Which is which is really I mean even in Exodus it says that. I mean let me just find that for you very. So Exodus thirty, I think thirty two, yeah. and this is verse thirty one. And Moses returned returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this pe oh these people have sinned a great sin. And made gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee out of thy book which thou hast written. The Lord said unto Moses, Whoever hath sinned against me, him I will blot out of my book. And this was, um, uh, you, you, this was the, the, this is the concept that, you know, you can seek forgiveness from God directly, and He can forgive your sin. There's no issues with that at all. Right. It's amazing how much of the Bible actually supports what we believe as muslims however oh, absolutely what they absolutely. what they've been taught in the church yeah. goes completely against completely it. completely and you know jackson we were discussing earlier that paul when he's summoned to the council of jerusalem this was after jesus apparently was crucified of course we don't believe he was but uh, he's t he's told to take the Nazarite vow, which is to sacrifice an animal and shave his head. So why were they still sacrificing animals if they said that the sacrifice, the blood of Jesus was the end of all sacrifices? It just doesn't make sense. There are so many inconsistencies down. here. Mm. You know, it just does wow. not make sense. There's so many inconsistencies here. And, and as you said, um, if you look at the Bible, um, if you look at the Lord's Prayer even, <laughs> You know, it's it's basically it's a you could argue it's a beautiful prayer, which is basically praying to the Father right. for forgiveness, which is to repent and to to forgive, to ask for forgiveness, which is basically our concept in Islam, which is that you uh, there are three criteria for, for for being forgiven. One is that you regret what you did, so you are aware uh, what you did was wrong, and uh, the second one would be that you. Um, um, make an intention not to return back to the sin. And the third one is that you ask for Allah's forgiveness with sincerity. And if you satisfy these three criteria, then the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that once you're sincere and you ask Allah for, for forgiveness, don't keep thinking about the sin. Oh, we've got two ijazes, mashallah. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So don't uh, don't uh, even don't keep even thinking and, and regurgitating your mind, as it were, over that sin. Know that Allah has forgiven you. I mean, subhanAllah, this is mercy of Allah, right? 
And, 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 and Allah said that even if your sins stretch from the earth and the heavens and you once again return to that sin, and as long as you turn back to me and you satisfy those three criteria again, and you're truly sincere, making an intention not to return to the sin, and you are, you feel guilt, you feel remorse for what you did, Allah says, I'll forgive you again. I mean, this is the mercy in Islam. And this seems to be very much confirmed with some of those passages that uh, the doctor and Jordan have actually said to you. Uh, I don't know if Jaz, if you were listening and if you'd like to add anything at all in there. Well, before he does that, though, it's funny because they 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 pretend or they like to say that that the God that we believe is not sufficient because we have to do works to be forgiven. They say that a lot. I hear that a lot from many Christians that we have to do works in order to be forgiven as if that's some way of saying that God is insufficient. Uh, doesn't the Bible say something about works without faith? Uh, the book of it, James, yeah. The book of James, doctor, can you give the quote? Yeah, right. So the, the whole book of James is actually works without faith. Uh, is it, it, So you can't you can't have either of them. You need both of them. So um, let me, if I can find a, someone can find the quote while we're, we're talking. But this in Islam, we don't have a works-based system. This is a misconception. Prophet mm -hmm. Peter was asked, who uh, actually said um, uh, to the companions, "Rejoice because uh, your deeds will never take you to paradise." And they said, "Oh, not even you, a messenger of Allah." He goes, "No, unless the uh, the mercy of God or the rahmah of God covers me." So we have a grace-based system. The actions that we have is a manifestation of our faith. They're not the means by which we achieve paradise. The the, right. the reason that we get to paradise is because Allah is loving and merciful and will cover our shortcomings. But you can't be you can't be a good uh, you can't be a believing Muslim and then act in a bad way, because that goes against the claim of faith. So your actions are necessarily part of your uh, manifestation of your faith. So this right. is why in Surah al it says, you know, uh, the first, the, everyone is in loss except for the first criteria is belief and then good deeds. And it goes on to talk about patience and, and perseverance. But the, the whole point here, sorry, calling to truth, but the whole point here is, is that you, the belief leads to actions because your belief means that you would act in a certain way. And this is, uh, so this quote, who put the quote up? It says, uh, uh, what, so this is the book of James, James Brother. Charles, chapter yeah? 2, verses 14 to 19. Perfect. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can this kind of faith save him? If a brother or sister is a poorly clothed and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat well, but you do not give them what the body needs, what good is it? Also, also faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. So someone will say you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith. I think the next bit is... Um, Without works, I assume. Yeah. But someone will say, uh, I have faith and I have, uh, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you faith by my works. You believe that God is one and well and good, but even the demons believe that and tremble with fear. So, what James is really clearly saying here is belief is insufficient. Even the demons believe that and tremble with fear. Fascinating, isn't it, Jackson? <laughs> It's pretty much the same exact thing that we believe, right? Yes. They try to set themselves apart by saying that, but really we believe the same thing. It's just them trying to find a difference. Yeah, but, no, the but there's a problem because they can't, if, if Jesus is the only, if the death of Jesus on the cross is the only way for salvation, then it doesn't matter what you do. This is why your actions now have to become, have to become meaningless and meaning, you know, because your actions are, they don't, they don't do anything for you. You can't do anything to help yourself. You need someone to die for you, Jackson. That's what they're trying, and that's where this, you know, um, you know, the extreme, you okay, know, Calvinist position is, you know, uh, all the people already chosen. You can't. There's no point even speaking to anyone to try and save them. They're already pre-chosen, and they're going to believe, and they're the ones that Jesus died for. Everyone else is, you know, irrelevant. So these, it's really a convoluted um, system, and and the picture of God painted by this system is just horrific. There's no love. There's no mercy. Subhanallah. You know. Right, right. But that's the system that they have faith in. So they believe if you have faith in that, that Jesus mm. did die for your sins and then the manifestation it's, it's, of that would be your good works. That's what they yeah, believe. Yeah. But really, I mean, it's a, it's a nice out, isn't it? Don't, you don't have to do anything, Jackson. Just believe this. 
Well, so, so there's Hindus who say it doesn't matter what you believe, just do good things. And there's Christians who are that extreme who say it doesn't matter what you do, just believe these things. By like Jesus dying for your sins. And then there's everyone else, the Muslims, who are saying we are the middle path, that you need both of these things. And ultimately it's the mercy of God that covers you. Right, but I think there's a misconception, like you said before, when I was speaking with them, they believe, the ladies that I spoke with, they specifically believe, similar to what we believe, however, their conception or their misconception about us is that we believe you only do good works and that's, that's how you right. get into yeah. heaven. So, that's right. You know, Jackson, we have a beautiful saying, I'm sure you have it in England, uh, in America as well. I think you're from the States, right? Is that right, Jackson? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So uh, in England, we have a saying that, you know, um, actions speak louder than words, oh, yeah. you know? And yeah. so basically, it's very easy to say things, but, you know, it's not that easy to actually uh, act upon what you say, right? So if you claim to be charitable, but then you're not really charitable. If you claim to be uh, a, a, a lover of Jesus, yet you don't do any of the laws that Jesus himself adhered to. So, for example, he was circumcised, he fasted, uh, you know, he wore loose clothing, not tight, revealing clothing. For example, the mother of Jesus covered her hair like a hijab. Basically, every picture shows that, right? So you claim all this love yet you don't imitate or copy or do anything that Jesus did. And yet when you look at the Muslims, you know, the Muslims are in the Garden of Gethsemane, it says Jesus put his face onto the ground and he worshipped his Lord. Muslims are praying in the same way. Jesus was circumcised. Muslims are circumcised. Uh, Jesus didn't eat pork. Muslims don't eat pork. Y you know, Jesus prayed to the Father. The Muslims pray to the Father. I mean, the point I'm trying to make to you is that they claim they love Jesus, yet they don't copy anything Jesus did or imitate Jesus. They listen to what Paul said to them. Paul, oh, right. Everything's about what Paul said, what Paul said. So who are they really following? Are they following Paul or are they following Jesus? Clearly, they're not following Jesus. They're following Paul. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know? Right. And I've heard so, Hamza speak a lot about Paul on his channel, so... I've been yeah. learning a lot about where they get those things from regarding Paul. Yeah. And that, yeah. I mean, that has opened me up to a lot too. I didn't, as a Christian, when I was younger, I didn't realize all of that. But now after becoming Muslim, it's like, I can see, I can see it so clearly now. I understand Christianity a lot better now. And when you look at Christianity as it is, as far as um, what they teach about what Jesus actually did throughout his life, I noticed that we're more aligned with that. Yeah opposed to what Paul came and said in the so, Bible. So, you know, a lot of our obligations, like, for example, fasting. Now, fasting is something that nobody really can witness because you can eat secretly, you could drink secretly. Nobody would know, right? Now, it's a measure of your faith and your, and your obedience to your creator that even in secret, you're fasting, <laughs> that you don't just sneak in some food or you don't sneak in drink, right? That's right. a manifestation of your faith. Your actions yeah. are a manifestation of your faith. Having to wake up for Fajr, okay? Nobody's going to know if you don't wake up at 5.30 in the morning and you're praying or you're not praying. Nobody's really going to know, are they? You could just go to the toilet, go back into your bed. Nobody's going to know. But the fact that you break your sleep, and sometimes it's cold and it's not easy to get out of bed and get into the cold bathroom and wash up and clean up before your prayer. Like Abraham, like, uh, like uh, Moses did, or as, as we're told, he did his ablution as well he, before he prayed, right? It's not easy to do that, right? But it's a manifestation of your love for your creator because he's made it an obligation upon you. And even in private, you have to. Uh, abide by those obligations and what that shows you is that a person without faith doesn't pray a person without faith does not um, fast and that's exactly what you find people who are do who don't really believe um, they don't pray they don't fast they don't do the obligations you know it's not easy to give away your wealth in zakat in charity right but as a Muslim, you have to do that, right? Now, one thing, one thing that they say, though, I'm sorry to cut you off, but one thing that they say a lot, I've heard it from the, the Christians that I speak to, they, they feel, it seems like they feel like we lack faith because it is an obligation for us to do these things. 
we're not just voluntarily doing it. It is an obligation in what our belief that we have to do this. But it's an obligation that you can either follow or you can ignore. And if you lack faith, you're going to ignore it because that's what lack of faith does. Lack of faith means, let's say, for example, um, if uh, if your wife claims that she loves you, right? right? And you say to her, you know, I've got a really bad headache. Um, I can't get out of bed. Can you make me, can you just please get me a cup of tea or something? I haven't had anything to eat. Yeah. And she says, you know what? I ain't got no time. I'm busy. I'm not going to do nothing for you. You'd think, well, that's a lack of compassion. That's a lack of love, right? Because the actions don't seem to line up with the claim of being loving and caring and respectful, right? Now, Allah's obviously stature for us is much higher than any stature of any husband or wife or relationship, right? right? You say, if you say that you love God and you abide by the principles and the rules and the obligations that that creator has set for you, if you don't follow those things, because nobody's putting a gun to your head and saying you have to do these things. Right. If you don't, if you're not doing them, what does that show? It shows exactly. you have a lack of faith. You have a lack of belief. So it's, it's it, you, this, this claim that you're only doing it because it's an obligation. Yes, you're, you're, we're doing it because it's an obligation, but because we love Allah, because we want to be grateful to Allah, because we want to be thankful to Allah, because we want to put our money where our mouth is, which yeah. is that we're prepared to make the effort and struggle in order to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not just simply say, oh, I, I, I believe in Jesus dying on the cross, uh, you know, I can now go to the bar and I can do, I can chat up that girl and I can take her home and have a good time. It's okay because, you know, I, I believe in Jesus being crucified. So everything's fine. I can have a little flutter on the horses, do a bit of gambling here and there. I can drink a bit of alcohol. I can, you know, I can, I can watch things on TV. I can move in with my girlfriend, even though we're not married. That system is, is so flawed because it's conducive to, to decreasing faith. Exactly. If you submerge yourself in into those environments because you believe that Jesus died and that's it, your faith is going to decrease. You're going to be. What kind of environment is that? You know. Yeah. Can I can I ask Brother Jackson a question? Um, so. Before you do, Jordan, I just want to yeah. clarify this point before we get into problems. You know, yeah. um, um, we've got a claim here. Which girl? Am I? <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't, I wasn't talking about myself, Shayness. Please. This is a general point, Jordan. Back please. Off. <laughs> um, and this is um, just interesting, Jackson. I'm listening to you clearly studying a lot about Christianity. And uh, I'm just interested in myself. You've been Muslim a year, right? Yes, yes. What, what is it that makes you feel you need to look so in depth into Christianity still? Um, you know, you've been Muslim a year, probably a lot. I'm, I'm sure you're studying Islam as well a lot. What, what makes you, just out of interest, because I see a lot of reverts doing this, what is it that makes you so... <clears throat> Because obviously it's Christianity is something you rejected before you came to Islam. What right. is your uh, motivation for so much in-depth look into Paul and this and, and all the Christian stuff? Well, I mean, we share the planet with a lot of people. And I believe about half of the people sway the other way. About half the people that we share the planet with believe in that. They believe in the opposite of what we believe in. So since learning about Islam and and finding it to be true, I believe that that I've also learned a lot about Christianity that I didn't know before, and it it just amazes me how much it lines up with what we believe, but how much it's also been corrupted, not even necessarily by the book, because overall, from what I'm learning in the book, a lot of it aligns with what we believe, but in the church, the influence that that people have over the, the the perspectives that they put onto the the believers, um, it just amazes me how how people have gone that astray. When you have Islam right here, and and I deal with a lot of Christians, so when people challenge me on my faith, I would love to understand where they're coming from and be able to to handle it. So that's what kind of drives me to learn a little bit more about Christianity. I don't want to say that I rejected it out of ignorance i want to at least know about like what it is and and why i believe why i still choose to believe that islam is true i appreciate your answer 
Yeah, alhamdulillah. I hope it made sense. I, I was all over. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just always interested because I, I speak to a lot of, um, you know, when I speak to a lot of Muslims um, or reverts, for example, that um, feel they need to pick up the Bible and start learning verses. And for me, it's interesting. I think maybe because for me, I didn't really have a connection to Christianity anyway. Maybe you did. And there's still some things, you know, that you kind of, and like I say, it seems to be almost an imam boost, does it? When you see these things kind of lining up and things like that. Right. And I wasn't much of a Christian before. I mean, before I became Muslim, I was atheist for a few years. And then I saw Joe Rogan talk about agnostic and I realized, oh, I'm not atheist. I'm actually agnostic. I just don't believe that there's proof for a God. And then Islam, to me, it proved that there is a God. So that's why I believe in and uh, that's why I follow Islam. But no, I wasn't a big Christian. It's just it's just fascinating how it's just fascinating understanding why people believe what they believe and learning a little bit more about it yeah i think what it is jackson is that uh, most people um in psychology you learn you know there are two types of people they're concept driven and they're data driven and most people are concept driven in other words they just simply um they already believe certain things and then they follow a, a principle of confirmation bias so that's why when they read the scripture and they read the bible all these verses that talk about Jesus praying to, to the Father, Jesus fasting, Jesus, you know, um, not eating pork. They ignore all of those verses. <laughs> and then they look at the verses that just confirm what they want to believe anyway. And most people are like that. Now, obviously, there are Muslims like that as well who don't follow, don't study the scriptures. They don't study the Quran. And, you know, just basically they they, they don't know much about Christianity or comparative religions. Uh, and they just take whatever snippets they can in order to build their own case. But w we shouldn't do that. We should be of people of knowledge. We should um, ha have an intense connection um, and, and, and a deep learning. And Alhamdulillah, most Muslim, a lot of Muslims, of course, um, they, they do. But the point is, most people are concept driven. They're not data driven. Uh, you know, even if you bring, if, even if you show a Christian, for example, when they claim the Bible is inerrant and, you know, it's um, it's the word of God. And then you show them where all of the problems where it's clearly not inerrant and it clearly seems to have contradictions. It clearly seems to have clear errors. Uh, it, it, it has fabrications that are now documented because you don't have earlier manuscripts of certain verses or certain words that have been added in afterwards. Despite showing them all that evidence, they're still going to say no. Um, I still believe it's an error. I still believe it's, you know, they'll come up with excuses or they'll come up with, you know, excuses to still accept it. And uh, I think it's unfortunate, but it's an emotional decision. It's not a logical, it's not a rational decision for, for, for a lot of these people, to be honest. And that's why when you're, that's why when you're giving them dawah, if you're giving them dawah, you're answering their questions. Remember that it's not necessarily a logical fight, a logical argument, a data driven, um, you know, data driven argument. It's an it's an emotional argument. So you have to be gentle and soft and you have to try to just ask them questions. You know, if Jesus was doing all of this, why do you think we don't do it any longer? Oh, because Paul said so. But then Paul was summoned to the Council of Jerusalem for teaching things he wasn't supposed to be teaching. So how why are we trusting Paul? You know, and, and, and just, you know, asking them questions like that is sometimes helpful. But I hope the discussion has been helpful for you, Jackson. Of course, of course. And yeah. I appreciate it. I definitely do. No, we appreciate you for coming on. And inshallah, any time, my brother. It was a pleasure to meet yeah. you. Inshallah. This Sorry. is my third time. So Alhamdulillah, next time you guys will remember. You're welcome for the fourth <laughs> time, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah. Thank All you right, guys. brother. Assalamu alaikum. All right, brother uh, Cosmic, we're going to get your next. Just give me a quick thumbs up. And uh, we'll get your next. Just a quick thumbs up if you can. That's lovely. All right, great. We'll get your next. You can turn your camera off or you can leave it on as you please. Uh, there we go. Cosmic, welcome to the screen. Yes. Um, hello. Salam alaikum to everybody. Um, I've actually been following your channel for quite some time now, and I'm very impressed, um, especially Abbas and the doctor. And Ijaz, of course, and also Jordan, of course. Um, you, you know, you do a great job in articulating, communicating across the message in a very nice manner to the Western audience. Okay, uh, so that's 
really, really um, uh, great. Um, now, so I I have something to ask you guys, okay, yeah? And and I hope this doesn't offend you, okay? Um, so I'm a Muslim myself, okay, yeah? Okay, and um, um, unfortunately, when I speak to other Muslims about this, some get offended by this. So whatever I say, I don't mean to offend you, okay? Okay, so basically, as you know, we, we've had a lot of things happening in Palestine with the... Um, major onslaught by the um, Israeli regime, okay? And I think, you know, we've seen the way, especially the Western government leaders, and even um, in the Middle East and and so-called Muslim majority nations have act, acted as well. You know, it's like Israel have just had total domination to do whatever they want. No one can stop them, okay? Plus, you know, there's a lot... Lots more things, you know, that Israel has done, and they always seem seem to always get away with whatever they want. You know, it's, you know, I think it's quite rational and reasonable to say that what Israel wants, Israel gets, and it's is um, who's a dog and who's a tail. You know, if if you know what I mean. Okay, so my question is, okay, as the Quran is, um, I um, I take it, I take it, it's a book about the past. The present and the future, okay, um, and it includes you know big events in it, okay, you know like um, the major prophets like Moses and and the Pharaoh and so on. Now I think it's reasonable to say that that the Zionist regime or the Israeli regime and the Zionist influence has been in this earth in our lifetimes and um, and before our lifetimes for a, for a very long time and. I was wondering if you think that this and their corruption, basically, I was wondering if you would say that what they're doing is, is it mentioned in the Quran at all? Like, like how big they are, you know, because, because obviously they have a massive influence in, in, in the Western world and, and the world. Okay. Um, you know, I think it's, it's reasonable to say that, you know, they control the West to be honest with you or, at least, um, um, I yeah. think we can answer your question simply by saying that the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, told us that we would imitate the people of the book, inch by inch, step by step, which is what our Ummah has fallen into, generally speaking. So, will they have an impression upon us? The answer is yes, as the prophetic Sunnah speak spoken about this. Yes. Uh, I think even most of Surah Al-Baqarah and Ala Imran are about this topic itself as well, uh, about the people of the book and their mistakes in the past and possibly in the future as well. So I believe that the, the impression of uh, us imitating false and incorrect beliefs is there. If that's your question, I, I think that's the simple answer to it. I, I'm just confused by when you say people find this controversial or it might offend that's the part that okay. me. Yeah, right. So now I will now go to the thing, the part that is controversial. Okay. So I believe that this um, very powerful Zionist force is actually mentioned in the Quran. Okay. And I believe that they are the tribe of Gog, Yajuj, and Majuj. Okay. Now, when you look at um, what the Hadith say about the tribe of Yajuj, Yajuj and Majuj, you know, they would cause a lot of corruption in the world. They would be huge in numbers. I think there's a lot of evidence that, um, um, you know, that does um, agree with when you look at the power of the Zionist regime, okay? Let me give you an example, if I may, okay? So, for example, you know, there's a lot of um, theories out there that the, leading, the leaders of Israel um, is the sect of Ashkenazi sect, okay, whose origins are actually quite unclear because there's actually a lot of evidence that... Cosmic, Brother Cosmic, yeah. if, I, if, I, if you don't mind. Look, the thing here is this, right? <coughs> Excuse me. What we should try to do is rather than, you know, come up with these theories ourselves, there should be some academic exercise that's done especially when it comes to accessing the primary sources of information, the Arabic of the Qur'an, the Arabic of Hadith, and what the Prophet may have said about these issues, and then bringing it all together. I, I, from, I don't know if there is an opinion 
that the Israeli state or Zionists are going to be Yajid Majid. I've never heard that personally. I might be wrong. But all I'm saying is that we should refrain from coming up with hypotheses ourselves because I think it, it applies here. Because one of the one of the things about Yajid Majid is that for every human being, there'll be a hundred, a hundred of them, I think it is, or something like that. Uh, or a thousand or something. So, uh, you know, there, there are lots of things with the a prophecy that actually wouldn't fit um, um, with this scenario that you're speaking about. So I, I just think that it's um, these type of hypotheses are somewhat um, the fr- fruitless, really, because it's just sort of grappling in the dark, just guessing, really. It's not an academic exercise. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. And we should okay. just refrain. And there are more things. That there are sorry. There are other things that are far more important for us to concentrate on and 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 get right. Uh, and I would say these type of very, at the at the very least, very controversial sort of you know and and very out there type of theory. I, I, I would just stay, steer clear if I'm honest completely. I don't know if any of the brothers want to add anything. Just, do you want to say anything, uh, or, or doctor? Or, or yeah, when it comes to Islamic eschatology, especially about your Juj and Majuj, I don't think one should try to find them in today's world, because uh, the majority of the scholars believe when they appear, they will be apparent. It will not... It will not be something that we have to debate and discuss and investigate. Sorry about the noise. Jordan is banging around in the background there. So, <laughs> so I, would, uh, I would avoid uh, trying to identify that group of people personally. It'll just be a to be Okay. Um, um, it, okay, thank you. Um, if I can just respond to that, okay. So first, first of all, it's, this isn't actually my own personal hypothesis. Hy- I can't even say the word theory, okay. But I've... I've, I've collected it from different people, basically, okay? Now, one of them, he's also known as a controversial sheikh as well. His name is um, yeah, um, Sheikh Imran Hussain. Let's not mention okay. his name. Okay, okay, okay sorry. Um, but there are there are several other people as well, plus also other non-Muslim sources as well that argue that, um, you know, um, um, the uh, um, Yajuj Majuj are the Christian version of Gog and Magog as well, and and also um, it, you know it's kind of like in in line with with the Quran as well. As well, the other thing is, yeah. the other thing I want to just correct you on is the fact that this stream, this stream is called Dawa Clinic. It's yeah. supposed to be actually Dawa related questions. Um, it the open forum might be a better place to come and discuss this type of thing. Um, but what I would what I would say to you is that again, in the Prophet peace be upon him told us when there's differences of opinion and things like this, the best thing to do is go with the consensus of opinion, the general consensus. Picking one scholar here, one scholar there, it's, it tends to be a very fringe opinion. Uh, no disrespect to anybody here, um, but uh, as I say, this particular stream is actually to be for dawa related questions, and because we've got like six or seven people in the backstage. Um, you know, I just think that we have to be respectful for them for their time as well because they might not get on as a consequence. But, uh, but Jazakallah for coming on, my brother. I mean, look, it's a theory, it's a it's a hypothesis. Some people have come up with it, but it, but it's a very fringe opinion. Um, the fact that they're supposed to be trapped behind a wall and they cannot escape, and Allah says that on the day of judgment, uh, Allah will allow them to escape, and 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 they will be. Uh, what, what does the Quran say? They will be uh, literally climbing, jumping over one another. It would be like almost a pouring out of it. it, it there's so many things that it doesn't seem. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, okay. like, like I have a brother coming on, and then, inshallah, maybe in the future we can t- uh, we can discuss that. Okay, no problem. Okay, thank you for having me on. Welcome, thank you. You're welcome, brother. Okay. Um, Imran, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that at all. Or... No, I don't right. see how it, because ultimately these Could things are. Uh, one thing that uh, Imran who said. Okay. You've just muted yourself, Imran, for some reason. Yeah, Brother Jaws is going to add something. Oh. So yeah, my internet, everything that could go wrong with the internet connection is going wrong today, even the microphone. But yes, uh, um, personally, we do not take from Imran Hussein. Let me just make that clear. EFDA was an organization that does not endorse the views of Imran Hussein. And as a fellow Trinidadian, I feel like I have the responsibility 
of making that clear. <laughs> Stay with the majority of the ulama, inshallah. And you will be safe yeah, exactly. Life. Exactly. Yeah. But ultimately, practically, uh, what does this change about you in terms of what you have to do and what your yeah. responsibilities are? And so a lot of these things are going to be uh, moments where um, they're, they're going to be obvious, as Brother Jaz mentioned, when they happen. Uh, and the other thing is actually that, you know, you, what are you what are you going to do at that time? Are you going to try to adhere to your doing the best you can? It doesn't make a difference who yeah. we suspect they may be or suspect they're not. It's not practically of any benefit to you that's what i would like to have asked him maybe what, what, so, yeah, yeah. what what's mm. the next step saying we all agree now what really this is the thing, thing. Uh, this is the thing jordan you know we need to uh prioritize i, I mean you know, what will end up happening is sometimes people will end up watching these type of videos and discussions and they'll spend many hours on them um but reality is that the, the, the priorities of learning your deen learning your aqidah learning basic things of islam are, are far more important. Maybe the brother is very learned. I'm not judging mm. him personally, but this is just a general comment. Uh, brother Musa, if you can just give me a thumbs up, inshallah, and then we can get you on. Uh, you can turn your camera off or leave it on, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, brother Musa, welcome to the stream. Assalamu alaikum, brothers. How are you doing? Wa alaikum as brother. It's good stuff. I first want to say thank you so much, all you guys, Jazakala, for all the work you guys do. I've been uh, seeing your streams all through COVID and since before, and mashallah, you guys are spreading the word out there, and it's uh, it's, it's a great thing. So Jazakala for that. I think during COVID, I think it was me and Jordan, we started. <laughs> yeah, e EFL were the original streamers. That's yeah, right. me and Jordan. <laughs> Okay, I, was, I wasn't even bothering to colour my hair back then. <laughs> white and grey. And there was no green oh, screen. God, there was God. no like you know, no fancy graphics. It was just a mess. Anyway, <laughs> well, we got to it. It's like, um, brother, the, the question I had, um it's um it could kind of fall in both categories of you know uh, the dawah, yes, um, possibly even a, a, a doubt because it's something that's gone through my mind and then I, I reconcile uh, myself with it and I speak to, for example, atheist uh, colleagues or atheist friends and it comes up again. And um, in a nutshell, it's around um, gathered and uh, uh, free will. And I know this is something that we've, you guys have done you know, done to death on, on the show and you guys have spoken about. And it, at, at times, you know, I I I think yes I've got my head around it and things making sense. Um so but it was um and I was just ready to check my understanding really if I'm have I understood this correctly and am I am I am I sort of in you know imparting the the, the information that I have not to uh, to sort of atheist friends or people who who don't really sort of believe and and, and what they you know so the the um a classic comeback would be well if you have free will then you know how how you know if you go to heaven and or hell it must be written for you so how do you have free will and and if I understand this correctly again it's you know it's our it's our deeds and you know we uh, we have the free will to choose to do right or wrong depending on that is where we will ultimately go um, and uh, so. But there's other things that, for example, some of my goes like, well, what about things that you don't choose? Um, for example, you know, how you die, you know, or where you die. Or um, I know we don't choose that anyway. I know that's not a choice that we have, but it's something that, you know, they're saying you just, you know, because it can hit you out of the blue. Or, for example, if you get into an accident or, you know, something out of the blue happens to you, which isn't, by necessarily by choice is that something that is written for you um and was going to happen anyway um and i was kind of speaking to some of my friends and it that stumped me a bit and then i thought well actually is that then to do with it's it do we see this as a test from allah for us you know so you know we might have planned something for example to do and an event happens that was out of our control and now that thing can't happen and now we are left to now deal with the fallout of of that is that then a test for us how do we deal with this um i'm not sure if i'm framing my question no, you, properly, you framed so. it fairly well um uh, what, what it is brother is that the, the prophet peace be upon him 
we've got good teachings when it comes to very beautiful teachings when it comes to qadr uh, you know predestination um, destiny and what have you mm. which is that the prophet peace be upon him said don't go too deep into this subject mm. leave it, leave it and the reason why the Prophet obviously said that to us is because we won't understand it, we won't grapple it, because there is much mm-hmm. on the subject which is unseen. Right. But there are some fundamental concepts, foundational concepts that apply to Qadr. The, the first one would be that Allah is all just. Allah is perfectly mm-hmm. just. In other words, every component of our life, regardless of whether people look at it as a hard determinism or the, however they look at it, regardless of how they look at it, it's with the complete justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. The second thing is that we know, and I'm not necessarily going in order, is that on the day of judgment, nobody will complain that they were treated unjustly. In other words, they had no choice in the matter of doing what they did. Yes. The third thing is that you've mentioned about dying in an accident or dying here or suddenly something happening or something happening inadvertently, something unplanned. Mm. Everything happens by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah has a clear record of everything that is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Not an atom, not an electron, not a quark, not a string, if they exist. Nothing moves outside the will of Allah, the, con- the the complete and utter control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. But Allah, what we believe in a compatibilism, a compatibilist, sorry, uh, uh, scenario, nothing happens out of the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is in full control of everything. And Allah has also given us free will. Right. That we choose to obey or disobey. We choose to uh, believe or uh, disbelief in other words but but hidayah guidance everything comes from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now the thing here is this and i'm just going to finish on this before the other brothers come in to reconcile qadr free will as uh, qadr predestiny sorry or destiny with free will is something that we cannot necessarily fully comprehend understand and fit the matters of this are unseen to us. Right. And we have to be satisfied with that because mm. in the Quran, Allah says that the, the believers, the true believers, are the ones who believe in the seen and the unseen. Yeah. So there are certain things Allah has made plain, has made very seen to us. Mm-hmm. And there are certain things that Allah has kept to hit with himself. But the yeah. information that Allah has provided us is that Allah is Allah encourages us to strive to do good, to mm. uh, to follow the teachings that Allah has given, yeah. to obey Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and Allah promises us reward if we do that, and punishment, of course, if we don't. Right mm. now, that would all indicate that there is a mechanism there why we are making choices. Yeah. And we're choosing to do things, but how those two things fully, com- uh, you know, reconcile, fully fit together, is not something necessarily that we're able to do. Similarly, we're not able to describe what the angels are like. What are the angels made of? How, mm. how do they look? We don't know. What does the soul? How does that work? What yeah. exactly is the soul? What's the soul made of? We don't know these things. And in fact, yeah. when the pre- when the Jews asked the Prophet peace be upon him about the nature of the soul. He told them, Allah, this is the this knowledge is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This knowledge has not been given to me. Yeah. I'm not in a position to be able to give you information on this because Allah has now if Allah has kept certain things from the Prophet himself, how can we suddenly become all knowing and completely mm-hmm. encompass all knowledge when it comes? We can't. But Absolutely. the important the important thing is, am I going to be judged fairly? Am I going to be judged in relation to the choices that I have made? Allah, Allah has already told us, yes. Mm. There's no yeah. problem, alhamdulillah, there. Uh, there's no issue, there's no worry. But I'll let Dr. Inshallah and uh, Jordan know, add anything to that, Inshallah. Jazakallah, Brother Ras, thank you. And Jordan, anything you want to add? Uh, yeah, I guess I, I'll go quickly. That, uh, it's not something that I struggle with. Did you say, Musa, that is it your doubt or is it, a, is it you struggle giving other people... Dawah, you give non struggle giving non Muslims it. 
Yeah, a bit, a bit of both, um, uh, Jordan. So it was in a while ago. It was a, something that it was within me. I would say, mm. um, but then I, I kind of uh, like Brother Boss uh, saying, yeah, yes, you know, understood. You know, that's just something which is going to be difficult for yeah. me to fully grasp. And then it's then just when I'm then either talking with you know atheist friends or colleagues, and they bring it up. Um, and they get to this point and they're like, you know, then then they keep on pushing. And I'm like, well, I don't, you know, yeah. don't know. And then and then they they sort of plant that. I wouldn't say plant the seed again, but it's just kind of like, well, actually, am I do am I doing the right? Am am I explaining myself well to them? Which yeah. is why I thought I'd come to your brothers for well, maybe maybe because I mean I don't think anyone explains this topic better than Dr. Imran. <laughs> yeah. he'll, he'll go, he'll go in. But I think for me, my, with my simple brain, I know that Allah is all knowing, right? I know Allah is all yeah. knowing. Uh, I have many options that I can choose in my life. Allah knows all of these options. He knows what I'm going to choose. Yes. So, so I don't really have an issue with with this problem of Qadam for you. It makes sense to me. I, I know that Allah works outside of time. So I don't have to tie myself up in knots going to the end and then thinking, well, hang on a minute. He already knows I'm in heaven. Da, da, da. It, I take that. You've got to take that kind of way of thinking out for me. It's it's mm. Allah is all knowing. Allah is all wise. He knows, knows everything that's going to happen knows me better than I know myself, knows everything I'm going to do, knows the future. And for me, that that's quite simple. But um, yeah. I'll let Dr. Imran give you a lot more in-depth. <laughs> in <depth, so. laughs> Thanks, brother. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. No, Alhamdulillah, I think you guys have explained it well. Uh, can I just want to clarify, because you, you said something about um, the things that you don't choose. Yes. Um, what was that point uh, you were making? Because that's yes, a different but, uh, thing from the free will question, isn't it? Yes. So, so uh, yeah, I mean, I think in my mind, I kind of linked it, um, uh, Dr. Ron, with the, you know, so for example, I choose, I've, I've planned a, a holiday, for example, you know, done everything that I can do. Uh, and then something happens uh, out of control, you know, I have an accident, I fall ill, something happens that then can't happen. Um, and they said, okay, well, I, I, that wasn't something I chose. I had planned to do this. And it's almost like, you know, thing, events that happen to you um, versus things that you choose to do. So I, I get my, I understand about the free will side, um, that it's my choices and things that I um, decide to do or not to do um, that inform, you know, what my actions. But then if there's certain things outside of my control, are those then written for me and they would happen regardless um and then these are th ways for me to be tested i i, I suppose yeah so you, you've you've got it right so it, it is so there's a general principle uh, uh just to summarize what the brothers were saying yeah so it doesn't it doesn't happen because it's written yeah it's written because it happens yes so you have to have that shift in your mindset so it doesn't happen because it's written it's written because yeah. it happens so it's yeah. foreknowledge of your choices that you will make that yes. Allah has you understand yes. now ultimately as brother abbas said every everything is under his control anyway and this is where this this dual aspect comes in which is we're not going to be able to rationalize this because we we can't get into the mind of allah so to speak mm -hmm. but ultimately your your promise your free will now the the choices that you are given to make are moral choices mm -hmm. and everything else is the circumstances of those choices so like you said you want to go somewhere and it doesn't happen yeah. So what, you know, it's not something I chose. So the circumstances of everyone's test is individual, which right. is fascinating because we don't believe Allah will judge everyone the same way. Yes. Everyone will be judged individually according to their specific circumstances and conditions. Mm, right. So even so, that child that uh, so that maybe adolescent who was who dies in Palestine, um, or that someone who is in a um, there's someone who is in, uh, you know, in, in a place where they can choose between right and wrong or someone who's born without an arm or someone who's born mm. with maybe a stammer or someone who's born with outside. Everyone's circumstances are, are individual and you'll be judged according to your individual circumstances. There's no injustice here. Yes. So the right. thing that we, we, so sometimes when people think about tests is, oh, we, we should all be tested the same, right? <laughs> and that's a problem because no, that's not right. Yeah. Absolutely. The reality is, is actually the this is a everything is a test for every individual in their individual circumstances, and they have to make choices according to that. Now, what the whole point here is, is that you have um, you have you have your ability to make your moral choices in those circumstances, and you'll be judged according to your personal individual circumstances. Right. Someone's put a someone's put a, put a Steve a, a great question. What is the point of testing non-believers? 
<laughs> so actually, it's a very great question. I love that, Luke's deep, deep thinker. So one of the things actually is very important is um, you, you can't be, you can't judge an individual or condemn an individual with your judgment in a just mm. way without letting them do the test. Yeah. So even if there's someone who you give a maths test to, for example, you're a teacher and they just put a line through it and ignore it. The fact that they've done that is what then allows you to say, okay, you've failed this test or you've not decided to participate or whatever that might be. And that yeah. leads to a judgment. If the person hadn't sat the test, if they hadn't done a test, you can't justly reward them or punish them. That's true. Yeah. But some people say, well, well, if God knows where everyone will go, why not just put them in there in the first place? Well, then you can say, well, do I deserve this? Do I deserve to be in hell or do I deserve to be in heaven? No, the mm. reason, the just thing to do is, so say, for example, you were doing a maths test and I said, actually, don't do the test, uh, Musa. Uh, I know you really well. I've been teaching you maths for the last 10 years. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give you a B minus. Mm. Is that okay? Are you happy with that? <laughs> You're not happy with that, are you? No, no. <laughs> you, 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 you want to do the test because that's just a just thing, isn't it? Absolutely. And then, but then if you got if you got B minus in your test because you sat it, you think, okay, well, this is why my effort is going to this. I deserve the result of this. But then, a brother and aunt, sorry for yeah. for cutting you off. For example, no in in this in this test scenario, like is it, is it really really nice. I, I I love that. But then, for example, if I uh, you know again, I can't think of any other example. If I fall ill or I, or I break my arm and I and I can't sit my test and um you know, but I'm prepared for it and I've done what I can. Um, I suppose th this is that sort of dual element that I'm talking about. So I've done, you know, if th that happens out of my control, is it then how I deal with that, which is then the test that I'm in? Is th if, does that make sense? Yes. So yeah. let, me give a, let me give an example that will help. So there will be prophets on the Day of Judgment who will come before Allah with zero followers. Right. Oh, Did wow. they fail? Did they fail? So, no. No. <laughs> no. So it's, it's amazing because what... Uh, what I looked, what what's looked for is your effort, not the result. Subhanallah. subhanallah. So in in life, what we look at results. And it's strange. I was talking to my kids <laughs> about this the other day that in life people judge us according to what you got in your test or what you got. Yes. But Allah judges us by he because he knows that we're talking about those specific individual circumstances. Mm. So say for example, someone spent the whole day doing something really strenuous and difficult or whatever, and then they come and then they they know I need I've got another obligation and I'm going to do this for the sake of it, and they do that thing. Mm. No one is aware of this, but Allah judges them according to the effort, even if they don't do much contribution in that whatever they were doing. It's not about the result; it's about the effort, and Allah judges you on your efforts. So there's a surah. I was looking for. I was trying to look for the verse actually. It's surah 53. Uh, let me just find it very quickly. Because it's it's really important to these verses are amazing, subhanAllah, and it's really mm. important to contemplate them. Let me see if I can find it very quickly. Um because it's really about the fact that it's your efforts that uh, that count. Uh, that's so amazing, Doctor uh, Doctor Ron. That, that's doctor, really one doctor is fine. Uh, I, I recall the story of the one of the Sahaba who basically the Prophet called for people to come with wealth to fund the uh, Ghazwa, the Ghazwa, which is the uh, expedition, you know, right. um, and one Sahabi had no money. So he basically pulled water out of a well all night and he was paid oh. just a few dry dates in his hand. Oh, wow. And the next day he came and he gave those dry dates, yes. Wow. And, the, and the Munafik, the hypocrites, they mocked him. <laughs> what's, oh. what's a handful of dates going to do? <laughs> yeah. Mm. And the Prophet immediately co corrected them, and he said that these dates in the sight of Allah are more than a mountain of you know. Subhanallah, he explained. Wow, subhanallah, Subhanallah. Wow. Yeah. It was because of his sincerity. Wow. His effort, not the. And Doctor, have you found the verse? Sorry, I wow. was just. Sorry. The verse, actually, Brother Shown us uh, has put the verse up very amazingly. <laughs> so it says, uh, this is Surah 53, uh, Najm, and it's verse uh, 39. I'll start from 38. They state that no soul burdened with sin will bear the burden of another, and that each person will have only what they endeavored towards, and that the outcome of their endeavors will be seen in their record. And they will be fully rewarded, and that your Lord alone is the ultimate uh, of return of all things. So endeavor is it's about efforts. This is all about what no, you no, no. worked. It's not the, what you got in the end. If you so, this is why we have the concept of if your intention was I'm going to do this, but it doesn't happen. You're given the reward. Of that. 
Subhanallah, subhanallah. Because you were because the circumstances adjusted it so that you, uh, yeah. Allah, Allah is in control of this, that you weren't able to fulfill that function, but your intention mm. was there to do it. So Allah wow. rewards your intentions. But it's interesting that sins are not rewarded in the same way. In fact, if you had a thought of a sin and you didn't do it, uh, Allah will mm. give you a reward for this. So, so subhanallah, it's amazing. Subhanallah, subhanallah. <laughs> But if you're uh -huh. so the, everything you should do, uh, the in, the intention in your mind should be, I'm going to do this for the sake of Allah. So li mm -hmm. literally, you get up in the morning, um, and you're going to have uh, you're going to brush your teeth. You know, the, the mm -hmm. sunnah of the Prophet is to uh, do use the miswak before the salah because he didn't like to offend the people with their smell from the mouth. Mm -hmm. Same reason. So I'm going to do this for the sake of Allah and make sure mm -hmm. that the people I interact with are. You know, or I'm going to eat. Allah has given me this body, and I have I've been given this um, body that I need to look after. It's an imana, so I'm going to make sure that I look after it. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to eat well. I'm yeah. going to, you know, and then you go for a five mile jog or, or whatever you're doing, ten, ten minute bike. Mm. It's because, because your intention is that this is for the sake of Allah to look after the imana that He's given you. Yeah. That becomes a, these. This is how you start to get the rewards from doing this. So that it's, kind of becomes a worship in itself. Completely. So this becomes a type of ibadah. So, and this is why even you know because the sleeping outside of marriage with somebody outside of marriage is sinful. Within mm. marriage is actually rewarded. Subhanallah. So we wow. have a we have an amazing uh, f a way of approaching this. But ultimately, the the thing here is is that. Uh, you're given a, the ability to make choices within your specific circumstances, and it's your yeah. effort towards making the right choices and fulfilling those that's mm -hmm. going to be judged. And everyone is judged individually. So if there's 8 billion people here, 8 billion people will be judged individually with their own specific tests, and there will oh. be no injustice given to anyone. And oh. trying to get your mind around all of that, it's <laughs> actually, subhanAllah, quite a difficult thing to do. <laughs> It is. Brothers, thank you. You guys have been, mashallah, mashallah, amazed. That, that, uh, Dr. Man, that is absolutely changed my perception that you just flipping um, it by saying you know it's not the result it's the effort that's really clicked with me so jazakallah so much and thank you all of you you know for... before you go you know what a beautiful um story we have of the lady who was supposed to be a prostitute a big sinner all her life mm. yes yes and then what does she do she climbs down into the well with a shoe in her mouth she gets some water to feed it to a thirsty dog Wow. And that one act results in her being forgiven and being given Jannah. It was wow. the sincerity of the mm. action that was valued by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And so this is this is what the, for us, this is this is why the first uh, uh, you know hadith that is recorded uh, by many compilers is that your actions are judged by your intentions. Mm. Everything is based upon your intention. Yeah, your intention is to feed, uh, to feed a cat, to feed a dog, uh, out of the love of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, because they're mm. His creatures, because they're suffering. Mm. That's going to be a lot more valuable than doing it because the cameras are there and people are going to say that you're yeah. <laughs> generous and you're a good person because you're looking after these animals. You see, absolutely. Because, and and this is where even ibadah, our, our acts of worship, if they are to show the people, show off, mm. they're worthless. Mm. Wow. And in fact, they will become a sin because on the day of judgment, when people are questioned, uh, why did they become uh, hufaz? Why did they become memorizers of the Quran? Mm. <laughs> they will say because we wanted to be learned and teach the people and we wanted to spread your deen and Allah will say you did it so the people would say that he is a messiah <laughs> that he's a memorizer wow. Wow. and then Allah will say to them and a, and a gathering will be brought and they will praise him mm. and Allah will say you have received that which you intended Oh wow! Subhanallah. Throw him into throw him into the hellfire. Oh my God! Wow! Right? In other words, our intention, everything, your actions are judged by your intention. Yeah. This is why we keep trying to say at, at the end of most streams that pray for us that what we're doing is not because of fame or God, God forbid fortune or um, because people will say, "Oh, mashallah, brothers, you're doing a great job." <laughs> Because if we do it for that reason, then everything we've done is lost. Yeah, 
Yeah. You see? It's all null and void, isn't it? Yeah. It's null and void. And in fact, it becomes a sin. It becomes mm. a noose around your neck on the day of judgment. Yeah. So, so stay humble, stay modest, and do stay for the humble, sake of stay mod- And remember, always remember that any good you do, Allah is the source. One of Allah's names is the source of all good. Mm-hmm. One of Allah's attributes. Mm-hmm. So anything good you see, even in yourself, yeah, you have to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. Absolutely. It's not from you. This is why when I said, I'm going to just finish, sorry, I'm going on, but I think it's very motivational <laughs> because there was, a, there was a group of people that came to see the Prophet, peace be upon him, one of those people he stood behind and he my cat's going nuts i'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. One, one of the one of the people he he um he he stood behind because he wanted to shower clean put clean clothes on put perfume on he didn't want to just turn up and see the prophet in in, in a way of traveling because you know when you're mm. traveling in the desert you're covered in dust and whatever. yeah so when he arrived the prophet peace be upon him said to him allah loves you for two reasons and he said, what are those reasons? He said, because number one, he said that you are very particular in terms of doing things in a good way. So what you, what he did basically was done in a, in a good way. You know, he, mm. he uh, presented himself very well. And the other one was that you remain uh, calm when you are angry. When somebody angers you, you remain, you refrain from losing it, basically. Mm, so th- that Sahabi asked a very beautiful question, and it's a great learning point for all of us. He asked Allah, he asked the Prophet, وسلم, sorry, did Allah nurture these qualities in me, or did I nurture them in me? Mm. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Allah nurtured them in you. Oh, subhanAllah. subhanAllah. This is why we say (laughs) all praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not some praise. All praise. Not sharing some of my praise and some (laughs) of uh, the praise from Allah. No, all praise for all good is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. Brothers, thank you so much. Brother of us, your hadith and your story, they really, mashallah, have stuck in my head and thank you um, brother jordan and uh, dr imran for your th- that that perspective change in in me so jazakallah um, brother thank you so much and uh, yeah right, lots of prayers for you guys inshallah allah ta'ala reward you guys in this world and and the next i mean jazakallah i mean it's from the mercy of dua inshallah it's a lovely to have you on my brother thank you brother assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam uh, you know, um, you know, this is the thing, Imran. When we start learning about, uh, and, and you know, Subhanallah, just even the basic things uh, about the Sira, about how the people interacted with the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, it, it is so moving, so inspiring, so incredibly beautiful. Subhanallah. May Allah encourage us all to do more and learn more because. One of the things that often comes up is when people say, you know, I lack khushu, I lack my, I lack my connection when I'm praying and when I'm doing these things, you know, and I say to people that, you know, it's because we don't intimately uh, know our creator. We don't bother to find out about these beautiful teachings. We're not connected to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with all of these beautiful teachings. How do you then expect to have that connection without even knowing uh, Allah, knowing Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, um, and so that, that's what we need to inshallah do. May Allah inspire all of us inshallah to do that. Uh, any anything to add, guys, before we get um, Brother Ali on? Alhamdulillah. Okay, you want to add anything, Imran? Uh, no, not really. I'm just just to reemphasize that I think I said this before that love is a function of knowledge. So the more you get to know. The more, if I, if you get to know someone very, 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 very well, you you find this is where the love will come. And so, what we need to do is learn more about the Prophet peace be upon him and about it's the, true. The, true. the attributes of Allah. And then, when you go into this in depth, this is where the true love comes. And this is where we lack, yeah. particularly in the modern world, where everything is done on the surface and yeah. you know without much attention. So, may Allah make it easier for us. It's true. And this I is why I love my brothers Imran and love my brother Jordan. You know. 
because uh, I only know a little bit about them. But if I get to know more about them, I may maybe change my mind. I'm just joking. <laughs> Lucky, <yeah>. luckily. <laughs> I'm going to get Brother Ali on next, inshallah. Uh, Brother Ali, uh, welcome to the stream. Walaikum <laughs> salam, brother. Walaikum salam. Um, I just had uh, two questions. Um, the first one is, um, uh, you know how uh, when when you breastfeed children, they become their madam. I just wanted to, I just wanted to ask, like, in, in what way does it make them madam? That's the first one. Sorry, what was the what was that? You're talking about young children when they. Breastfed by the same yeah. woman, they become milk siblings. Yeah, yeah. And how does it make them uh, martyrdom? Like, um, I don't know. Is it just because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said that it does, and that's it? Or? Yeah. So I don't. I mean, there's no, there's no, there's, no, there's nothing genetic that happens to that child. It's yeah, just the fact, yeah, just, the fact just the fact that they've, they've both been fed by the same woman. And so they become related to that woman in in that way of feeding, and that was understood as being now these people are uh, they sh basically they're sharing the, uh, the the milk of the person. So that anything you anything you consume essentially becomes a, you know, it, it's something it becomes a part of you. It's part of your growing up and your nurturing and your nourishment. But the the idea is that this makes you then um, related. I you cannot you cannot become married to each other, so you become mahram for each other. And uh, this, so the, how it happens, I mean, there's nothing physical that goes on that we would be aware of. But if this is how the Prophet, peace upon him, has said that this is the case, then Alhamdulillah, this is uh, the case. I, mean, I don't know if you want to add anything about to that. I'm not sure. Yeah, so the thing is that, you know, we do know, and doctor, maybe you can confirm this, obviously, because you're medically trained. But when the mother breastfeeds the child, there are certain aspects of... Uh, uh, antibodies and, and things that are fought um, and there is a benefit of breast milk as above to uh, not having breast milk so there's clearly something significant about the uh, breast milk of a mother that goes to her child and of course we don't know just how much that might or might not uh, influence that child because remember we're not talking about only things that are just purely biological uh, and a function of uh, of of matter and energy, these things could have some sort of a spiritual connection, spiritual con con uh, you know difference between being fed and not being fed. So we, ultimately, what it comes down to is that this is what the rules. Uh, this is the, what the rules are, and we don't necessarily have to know all of the perhaps the reasons behind it. Uh, but alhamdulillah, we we follow it because this is what we were taught by by the prophet peace be upon him and uh, by uh, in that re in that respect the knowledge would have come from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically brother ali how are you keeping anyway sorry how are you keeping i said you looks like you i'm sure you're not driving at like 100 miles an hour but it, from our point of view it looks like you're really speeding along <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I'm good. I'll, I'll... I watch I watch uh, Netflix series when I'm driving, so I thought well, if you guys. Saw it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's that's all good. Yeah, I'm I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Um, my second question was um, uh, to Dr. Um, um, I wanted to ask you if you know the reason why it's um connects from our brain, loops around our heart and then goes back to our voice box. Are you talking about the uh, vagus nerve? Hello. Can you hear can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I can't hear you very well. Are you talking about the vagus nerve? The laryngeal nerve? Laryngeal nerve? The recurrent laryngeal nerve. Yeah. So what's the f the the point here is what's the problem with it? No, no, I'm asking what the reason uh, being what was the reason why it comes down loops around our heart and goes back up to our voice box instead of this going is, directly to our voice. This is a, this is an embryological development. Um, 
is there a, is there a specific thing in mind? Has someone said to you that this therefore proves that we come from fish or something? What's what's the, where's the conclusion? <laughs> because it's because Sorry. what you're talking about is development of the embryo. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me, uh, brother Ali? Are you there? You're you're sort of breaking up, brother Ali. Yeah, I think you've got poor uh, signal at the moment. Yeah, brother Ali, maybe try again. Um, it seems it, 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 your voice is breaking up. Yeah. Maybe you can answer the question if you can, doctor. Address it in some way, and then maybe brother Ali can hear it afterwards. You're muted, Imran. Are you? Or is it me? Can't can't hear you. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I might, is it me? What's going on? Can you hear me now, guys? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. <laughs> can you hear me as well? Yes. <laughs> All right. What was going on there? I'm not sure of the. I think the the brother was talking about uh, the, there's a uh, the, there's a the nerve that has a tortuous root. One something called the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and I think he was asking about why does it have the root that it has. Mm. Um. Um, I think the question really for, for me to understand was what was the point of asking the question because it's just thought, a part of embryological development. The first question as well, I thought, you know, the, the intimate feeding of a mother breastfeeding a child and creating that bond between the two seems fairly to me like something I wouldn't even wouldn't even really question. Hmm. I, I think that because people, it's, it's I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, Mela make it easy, but it's the whole... Um, so it's interesting because Brother Abbas, is, he took a very uh, uh, sort of materialistic view, and he's correct that milk is a living tissue. So that means that it contains antibodies, it contains uh, blood cells that can be used to fight infection, and it part becomes a lot of these become part of the the um, the immune system of the child. Um, and there's other effects as well. You know, we know that if you're breastfeeding children, it actually affects it uh, affects something called so it has an epigenetic effect it affects methylation and these sorts of things now those aren't individual these aren't those aren't uh, those don't they don't those changes don't make you related in any way biologically to that person but there is some link but the point originally actually is something there's something beyond this that the prophet peace one said that this makes you now people who are um, related and therefore not mahram. Now mahram is not a bio, it's it's more than it's it's mm -hmm. a it's a state that's attributed to you by your the religion. So there's criteria within that. And if that's one of the criteria, then that's I don't see the I don't understand the reason for questioning this in any other way. Look, you know what it is? Mahram, there are certain uh, um aspects that a mahram, for example, uh you wouldn't need to uh be uh, in a vicinity in the same way as a non-mahram, for example, right? And so there are different uh, aspects that change things. And this could be a way of e making it easy for families. So when they take on a child that's very young and they've breastfed that child, that child basically becomes just like their own biological child in that sense, right? And therefore, they would not necessarily have to be... Um, you know, um, if they're alone with their mother, it wouldn't be an issue. But, but if it's a non mahram then there's a, obviously that can raise issues. So this could be a way of making things easy for people as well. So we, we have to look at it in that sense, I think. Um, I don't know if Jordan wanted to say anything, but otherwise we'll get to the next. Uh, Brother Saad, if you could have your camera on, um, and then we can just quickly interact with you. Um, and just give us a quick thought. That's lovely. Thank you, Saad. We're going to get you on next, inshallah. Uh, we're going to try to um, get through these uh, questions quickly now because there's still six, seven people waiting. I'd like to tr try to get them all on if possible. So let's see how it goes, inshallah. Brother Saad, welcome to the stream. Uh, hello, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. Everyone, uh, how are you? Alhamdulillah, we're fine, brother. Alhamdulillah. So actually, I have a very basic question uh, I, I've been thinking about this question for many, many days, uh, especially when I come across some horrible news or hear some unsettling events happening around the world. Uh, in Islam, in our deen, honoring parents is a very important principle. 
Uh, I have heard people say that the paradise lies in the fits of fit of your mothers. However, um, uh, some parents are toxic because these parents, um, you know, the toxicity of these parents can range in severity from overstepping personal boundaries to actions so harmful that these actions result in the child losing all the respect for their parents. However, in Islam, we have to respect, honor our parents as Quran says. Um, uh, I, I recognize that the uh, uh, the respect of children is uh, also something that we do not often discuss. But when I see these stories, yeah, it could be said that if the parents are toxic, it's a test of test for the children, because Allah says that we have made you. He has made us each other a trial. Um, he tests us with some of our own people. Uh, so this is the verse of the Quran. Uh, this is how I think about this. However, some parents go to the extreme level. They abuse the child. They molest the child. I have seen in the news. So now this child, if born in a Muslim family, grows up um, grows up with some sort of trauma from those abuse, losing a complete respect for the parents because those events flash back. So how, how, in your opinion, how do you think it would be possible to, for that child to um, show uh, uh, some level of res uh, respect because those things flashback at the back of the mind and it's traumatizing um, brother, especially brother Saad, brother Saad I think we we, we, we get the question That's okay. yeah you got the question yeah. Yeah. sorry to cut you off it's just that we've got so many people waiting I just want to be respectful of the time uh, Dr Imran why don't you start inshallah with this basically uh, you're muted okay alhamdulillah so uh, brother Saad I think you're you're confusing a couple of things so do you understand that the exception proves the rule do you understand this this percept, this concept this principle uh, exception proves the the exception proves the rule yeah I, I i got your point what do you mean by that what do i mean by this it validates the rule yeah so the rule is that parents are caring about their children that's the rule there are exceptions the exceptions proves the rule. So another way of looking at, you see, sometimes you see a person, we say people have two feet. Sometimes you see a person with one foot. It doesn't mean then you start talking about, oh, there's a variety of feet for people. It's just an exception that proves the rule that people have two feet. So generally speaking, and this is what this is what you have to understand, is that um, people, parents care about their children. And there are these exceptions that you described to maybe doing some horrible things to their children and you're talking about flashbacks you're talking about ptsd people who have post-traumatic yeah. stress disorder from exactly. whatever they're doing so you're, now you're talking about a mental health condition where if a person is now uh, brought before someone who may have abused them this causes flashbacks for them and they mentally cannot hand it so you're talking about another exception in terms of interacting with a family member or a, or a parent so, so the exceptions that you're giving are, are, are different from the rule. And when you have exceptions like this, if you're in a situation where, you know, uh, there was a situation where somebody has been abused and they're having this traumatic experiences from this and memories from this, and then they go to, uh, if they try to go in front of whichever parent or family member that was, this then becomes a problem for them. Then they're in a position where they can legitimately um, ask maybe a scholar to, this is the situation, and they will say... For you, then this is a different, you're in a different category. And for you, there's another way around this. Now, it doesn't mean you, you can, you can still, there can be people who, because you're not obliged to be in a position where somebody's abusing you and then you're showing respect to them because this is not, you know, oppression is worse than murder in Islam. Yeah. Do you understand? So, so what you, I understand what you're saying, but the respect is, this is like, you're, if you're, if you have a parent, and the parent has treated you well through through their life, etc. Then this is, um, you, they they deserve that and more from you. Okay, this is the vast majority of cases. The only issue I have is in the beginning you said you gave a few sort of nondescript like, the, you know, they're crossing bound. I'm not talking about 
you know, I disagree with how my parents are parenting me. This is a different thing. I'm talking about the exception being the rule where you're someone is being abused on there, having traumatic uh, ex uh, flashbacks, etc. Because of this, that's a so you talk, you can't take an extreme example and then generalize it to less ex like it, my parents didn't let me go out on Saturday. That's it. I'm gonna you know, I'm not going to give them. This is this is not the same. Um, do you understand what I'm what I mean by that? So yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand it completely. So, so the abuse doesn't mean that if someone is abusive to you and has abused you, it doesn't mean that you're required to then be indifferent to that. Some people are of this opinion that no matter how uh, traumatized, I mean, how toxic they are, because it's compulsory in Islam that we have to... Yes, yeah, Saad, I think you have to be very careful when we say uh, toxic... Your your version or your interpretation of toxic might be very different from somebody else's version of toxic, and it may be very different from what the Islamic perspective of what toxic really is. This is where you need to consult a scholar with your individual case, and they will give you a ruling. Now, there is a difference between uh, showing respect, uh, showing love, showing admiration, uh, you know, constantly being in the presence of your parents who are abusive and have been abusive, especially if it's an extreme situation of sexual abuse. And then you put your own children in risk of potentially being abused. That is something that you would not do and you would not be expected to do in Islam. Put yourself or your children in danger. But there is a difference between that and then being disrespectful to your parents i.e swearing at them shouting at them uh you know um and behaving uh, in, in you have to leave that up to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to deal with them if they've done these type of very horrifying horrific things to you when it comes to a lot of the other stuff about well you know my mom keeps interfering in my business or whatever you still have to tell her with kindness you know, my mother may be uh, harsh with my wife. You have to explain to her with kindness, but you have to be just in Islam. You do not side with your wife and you do not side with your mother. You side with that which is just. When your wife is wrong, you tell your wife, I think you're wrong on this. When your mother is wrong, you have to tell your mother in with kindness, with respect, that mum, you're wrong with this because this is Islam. Islam does not allow this type of inter this type of thing or this type of thing. But you have to be very clear in your understanding and your knowledge. It shouldn't just be your opinion, okay? And it's very important that, and a lot of marriages, especially, are broken up because the husband will either side completely with his mum. Or you know, or or his family, and even if that means that his wife is disrespected and she's treated badly, he won't speak out. And Islam is about being a, uh, you know, a being a a person of justice. So whenever there is a matter that has to be spoken, you can still speak it with kindness and with justice. But it doesn't mean that you have to scold your mother because she said or did something wrong. You still have to remain within the bounds that Islam has set on you. So can I just so just. Brother, so it's really about this because you gave an extreme example of abuse and then you used the general word toxic, which is, you know, nowadays the word toxic is used for anything. Even like, you know, oh, my parents don't let me play my Xbox until 12. They're toxic. It, it's so you have to be, we're just asking you to be specific with the things that you're saying that would be bad because you know toxic is it's just too general a word it doesn't mean anything which is why what you would do is don't just follow anyone's opinion but go to a specific person who can understand yeah. your circumstances who can help guide you through this it does that make sense brother sir uh yes i just want to know your opinion i have uh, thought about it because i see certain things in the news uh yeah. and uh, i just see your opinions and that's it i also did some research on this and uh, I just, uh, you know, people in our religion, they put so much emphasis on respecting parents. Uh, no one talks about respecting children. So that's what made me so this is interesting. Uh, do some introspection. Yeah, this is interesting. So there, actually, there's a lot about respecting children. They have rights. Yeah. You know, there are whole books written on how the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, interacted with the children that were around him. 
What was the name of the book? You, 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 there's lots. There's a whole series. I'll, I'll put a link in. I, I, I can't remember. If I read this when my children were young to try and improve this, my own. It's from Hadith or yeah. This so, uh, yeah. So what happens is that people have taken Hadith and they've taken the learning that you can in, take from them to see how the Prophet peace be upon him interacted with children around him and how he actually empowered them very much and he. One of the things that the Prophet used to do was actually give full attention. So in so nowadays, for example, even our normal interactions, when someone's talking to you, we will we will talk to them they're over there, and I will just talk to them even though I'm not looking directly at them. When the Prophet used to talk to somebody, he would turn and face them, and he would give them the full attention. And there are companions who are very very young who describe, um, who would describe that. When the Prophet peace be upon him spoke and how what he said and the effect that it had on them, and you got to remember Ali Radhagana, he was eleven, I think, when he became uh, uh, became Muslim, and he was being brought to the 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 discussions that the companions were having, uh, like very serious meetings, and they were saying, "Why you brought the child?" And he said, "And and he would allow that to happen. No, no, you need to bring this." There was the man who saw the Prophet peace be upon him kissing his grandchildren. And he said, you know, uh, we don't, we, I have, I have 10 children and I've never kissed any of them. And the Prophet said that the one who does not show mercy will not receive mercy. This is the one, uh, Sister Aisha, Jazakallah Khair. This series, I have this beautiful series. It was honest, I have it actually on CD. This is how old it is. But if you can find this series, it's, it's, it will teach you some amazing things about how the Prophet, peace be upon him, interacted with, with children. Uh, uh, another example was the Prophet, peace be upon him, was praying and was in sujood. And the chul and uh, Hassan Hussein, they were tiny, and they climbed on. May Allah be pleased. And climbed on top of the Prophet's person back. He stayed in sujood. And even to the point where the companions asking, you know, "Why were you so long in the sujood?" And the Prophet was explained that my children were, my grandchildren were on my back, and I didn't want to disturb them. And you see, this is the a beautiful rahmah, love for the child. Um, it's it's amazing relation. And what we what actually happens in modern societies, we've We've come away from this. We, we've actually created a distance between ourselves and our children in that we leave them in front of the iPad or the TV as a surrogate parent while we're busy doing our other things that probably are not as important. And this is something that we need to learn to, to come away from that. The, the thing the child needs from you is time and attention. Mm. And if you do that, then your relationships will be good. It's, it's when, it's when the, these things are not given that the relationships become bad. But... There's so much you can learn, and and there is a lot to learn about the Prophet Muhammad and how he interacted with children. I definitely recommend that um, you read into this a little bit more as part of your research. If you want to email us, brother, we can give you some more information on this, and we can send that. We can maybe try and give you links to that series, inshallah. Yeah, email address is in the description box. Uh, it will it'll come up on the screen any second now? Uh, there it is. And you can just email us, and then we will try and find you the link for that, inshallah. Yeah, yeah, I need some so resources. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you have I, to be, I, really, you have to, the because uh, even the Prophet explained that the children have rights over the parents. Now, the first right the child has is even before they're born. Brother Abbas has mentioned many times that you have to pick the right partner for yourself yeah, find for them, the child. Find, uh, find them a good mother. That's, That's the first right so of the even when you're even at the point of getting married, your one of your considerations should be is will this person be a good parent for our children? Now this is even before the children are born. So the level of interaction and the level of care and consideration that we have is is off the scales, nothing compared to what you see now. But you know, you know so often as Muslims we don't live up to the ideals of, of the Prophet Peace Point that has given us. You know, Mela, forgive our shortcomings and increase us. But definitely all I wanted to say to you is if there are personal circumstances an individual has with specific members of the family and they want to know how they can reduce the interaction in a way that doesn't make them sinful, then they need to specifically speak to a scholar about their personal yeah, circumstances definitely. and they can guide them on this, inshallah. Definitely. Uh, Brother, Brother Jordan, Jordan, anything you wanted to add? To no, that? nothing to add to that. Well no. answered. Please. Brother Saad, Jazakallah khair for coming on. No, thank you. We appreciate you. Asalaamu Alaikum. Thank you. Uh, brother Yusuf, you're next. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Asalaamu Alaikum, brothers. Wa alaikum as salam, brother. Yeah. Uh, I've got two, uh, two questions. I think the, the first question is related to Fitra, and I think the answers of the first question will overlap with the second question. Okay. So would you say Fitra in a philosophical term is, to a certain degree, is sort of like a priori? 
I didn't catch the question. Sorry, what was that again? My, my question was about fitra. Fitra. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Would you say, in a philosophical term, it's sort of like, to a certain degree, it's it's like a priori? It's a priori. Just, yeah. Um, I, I don't know, Doctor. Would you would you would you um, regard it as a priori, or what would you well, regard? I mean, it's, it's inter- what do you mean by a priori? Let's say, let's make sure we're answering the question in the way you're Ax- asking. Axiomatic, self-evident, something noble without, without you know providing any evidence. So it's it's based upon the interaction we had before we were ensouled into bodies. You know, you know, you know, you know, Allah Marafa, we where we were, we witnessed Allah, and Allah asked us, "Am I not your Lord?" And we said, "Yes." Mm-hmm. This is when we were souls. Yeah. You understand? So, a priori usually means without knowledge, and but there is this interaction. So, because what we what we're doing is, and this is sometimes we try to use terms that are really Western terms to describe mm-hmm. something yeah, that brother, sister, or sister straight path, brother straight path has hit the nails on the head. We're trying to use terms that are from maybe a, a certain tradition, and we're trying to fit yeah. our uh, tradition into that. So, really, the yeah. the fitra is a type of um, it's a type of instinct that is within us. Yeah. That that it's, so it's not it's it's just like a, the instinct that a, if you get a if you get a, if a chick hatches, baby chick, mm-hmm. if there's something that moves around, it will automatically run underneath the wing of its mother. It does not need to be taught this. It's automatic yeah. from that. And so this is a similar thing. It's, it's an instinct that allows us to to seek uh, Allah. Mm. But there's also this experience beforehand, before we were ensouled into a body, that we have mm. where we witnessed Allah and we we bear, we bear witness that Allah is our Lord. So it's, it doesn't it doesn't maybe fit specifically into this because it says without reference to particular facts or experience a priori, right? and that might just be a term. So generally, yes, but specifically, maybe that's not the correct term. No, no, that's yes. very, yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. And the reason that I, uh, because you know, sometimes I would, I would, you know, have a discussion with someone who is not from an Islamic culture, so therefore, to be easier for them to understand the word for more than Petra. Also, Brother Yusuf, you know what it is? Yes. There are certain yeah. beliefs that a child that hasn't been taught these things about mm-hmm. God, for example, and, and other things such as justice, such as um, cause and effect. These things are somehow, these are intuitive, even in a young child. So even a one-year-old, if it sees a a train coming in front of it, it doesn't assume the train just came into thin air. It looks for who pushed the train. True. Where did it come from? You know, and that's, that's, the other thing is that justice, you know, if you give one child a chocolate or a biscuit or cookie or whatever, if the other child is next to it, even a very young child, one-year-old, one and a half, whatever, Mm-hmm. They will immediately start crying. They'll get upset because they recognise this is an injustice that you've just done. Yeah. Yes, and I think yeah. there was a famous study, doctor, that you've mentioned many times at Oxford University. Um, Justin is it Barrett, Daniel, Daniel Dennett, is it? I believe that um, Justin Barrett, Daniel Dennett, Justin, Barrett. Justin, yeah. Justin Barrett. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think it was more than 150, 200 countries, yes. even in athe- even in atheistic, um, uh, you know, societies there was still a underlying assumption or foundational concept within very young children to believe in the supernatural, to believe yeah. in something. So yeah. these, are, these, are, these are things that, and you know, Doctor, I love the thing that you said about, and you've said this previously many months ago, but it stuck with me, which is that, um, can you think of anything that doesn't exist In other words, something that doesn't exist. Uh, any is there any word for anything or for something that doesn't exist? So any word you can think of, spaghetti, a monster, uh, moon, Saturn, custard. Around around Saturn, you can think of Saturn. You can think of custard. You can think of um, uh, spaghetti. You can think of monster. You can think of a spaghetti monster. You can think about these things. Those components assemble, and they become something. But they are all words to something that exists. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yet the atheist is claiming that this word God is the only word in all of linguistics, in all of language, 
for something that doesn't exist. Mm. Good. So, so my second question is related to atheism, actually. So, uh, since you've, you've interacted with, with atheists during uh, your Dara, may Allah bless you guys. Uh, would you say that 2% of the atheists are true atheists? Because they might, they might say we are atheists verbally, but viscerally, they're not. You, you can't be, actually. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I had a conversation with a guy on Sunday, um, and it's a guy who, Jordan, you were, you were with me. And I remember I asked the guy, what, would, what evidence would convince you of the existence of God? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and he said that if Jordan, if your leg was chopped off yeah. and it grew back immediately, mm-hmm. then, you know, that would make me think. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I asked him, it would make you think, but you still wouldn't be convinced. He goes, yeah. he goes no, it would make me think. Okay, yeah. but then I asked him another question, which was really, Jordan, that was really, uh, I thought it was really poignant, right? Yeah. In terms of yeah. his, his answer, right? Mm-hmm. I asked him, all right, you say you're a hard atheist, you say there's no evidence, but be honest with me, if you were on a crashing plane, would you pray to God? Okay. You know what he said? Huh? He said, if I, was a, if, if, if I was in a crashing plane, if mm-hmm. I was in a burning building, if I was mm-hmm. in a burning building, I probably would pray to God, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. If I'm not mistaken, atheists who were like in Titanic when it was like, you know, going down the sea, they were, they were like shouting. Yeah. So this yeah. is what the Quran says. And I said yeah, to him yeah. that this is what the Quran alludes to, that when the waves are crashing over one another and, you know, death is near, Allah says, yeah. who do you turn to? But you turn to me. Yeah. And then once again, when Allah returns you to safety, to security, to the shore, you become open opponents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again. Allah is telling us about the condition of the human nature, the human condition. Yeah. So Allah is telling us this is a self-evident truth. Yeah. But mm. you you are the one. And this is why. Why is there Jahannam, hellfire? Why is there paradise? Because mm. this notion about, oh, there's no evidence. What do the angels say to the people that they're dragging to hellfire? They turn to them and they say, "Did you not use your reason? Mm. Yeah. If you if you if you used your brain, what Allah gave you, you would have come up with the conclu- the correct conclusions, mm. but you didn't. Yeah. Because you it. it was an amazing conversation because I don't think I've ever met as any anyone as skeptical as that guy. Like uh, Ab- Abbas gave him uh, prophecies and, and and anything, and he was kind of no, that's, that's all rubbish. That's all rubbish. But that question at the end." It shows, and I heard Hamza Sources say this once, you might be speaking to the most hardcore atheists you know, but their fitra mm-hmm. underneath all of that garbage is still pumping. And I think yeah, that, that's yeah. what we stuck with me. And that yeah, was definitely viscerally. an example. Yeah, yeah, viscerally. So therefore, therefore, I don't, I don't think that uh, atheism exists. I think, I think John Fontaine said something interesting. He says that because of the way the way we're wired with the fitra, why not start the conversations assuming God exists? Why 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 go from the atheist paradigm, which is a very recent, I think, over the last four hundred yeah. years, right? Atheism is a very new thing, and um, yeah. And uh, John Fontaine talks about maybe don't maybe don't defend from the atheistic paradigm. Maybe just go straight yeah. in. Well, there is a God, and let them because because it's more ridiculous to go the other way around. But I think yeah. we're now in a sometimes when you speak to atheists, they think that they are the default position. And we are the ones that are making up stuff when in fact it's the other way around. Yeah, yeah. And basically they are disbelievers. They're not atheists. Yeah. Mm, exactly. And I think if you look at even, for example, the statistics um in the globe, uh, most people still believe in God. They believe in a higher power. Yeah. And even the ones who are hard atheists like Sam Harris, I think Imran, you mentioned this as well, right? Yeah. They're all moving to spirituality and they yeah. want to do, you know, meditation and they want to, what, what are they doing? They want to connect to something much greater than them. You know, I saw an interview with Sam Harris this many years ago where he was asked a question about depression and how to deal with it and what he said was uh he gave a few things and one of the things he said was that we need to be there's a lot of evidence about gratitude you need to have a journal where you can write that you're thankful for and you know i I often raise this that gratitude is like a transaction you 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 have to be grateful to something 
Yes. You can't just be grateful in the air, like I'm just grateful. You know, it doesn't mean anything. It's a transaction. So this is and, and this is really this is the fitter I speak. We are when we are grateful, Allah says, if you're grateful, I will give you more. I from the Quran, yeah. Now we we know that Allah says only in the remembrance of Allah do the hearts find rest. So gratitude is a type of dhikr, a type of remembrance. That gives you sakina. Sufan, it's amazing, isn't it? Mm. And it's, it's, the question to ask is, who are you grateful to? I've asked this question before, even in like a, in a psychiatry circles. That when people are doing these journals, who are they grateful to? And then they'll give, they'll anthropomorphize. They'll say, oh, they're grateful to the universe for their circumstances. So they'll give the universe the attributes of Allah in this receiving of the gratitude. Mm. Mm. So, mm. Can I add one more point? Sorry, go on, go, on, go, on, go on. It was just a really quick point because I read a book um, when I went to Medina. Um, there was a brother in the atheist part gave us a speech. I don't know if you remember Imran. It was a Swedish guy, and he, he recommended a book called Faith of the Fatherless. And it goes into all of the Dawkins, the Hitchens, uh, but into their biographies. And all of these top atheists that you think they're academic and they've made all these intellectual decisions, they actually admit that in, in their life, they, they made these decisions at like 10 years old. Like, like they made these academic decisions. So atheists often are people that have made these decisions as kids and they've built arguments on top of it. And I, mm. this is always interesting because uh, reverts get kind of accused of, you know, we, we're kind of going somewhere and just building arguments on top. But in fact, it's the atheists uh, that, that, that if you look into a lot of their top ones, that actually, you know, that the accusation is back on them. Mm -hmm. Jordan and Imran, I was talking to, and Brother Yusuf, I was talking to a guy who had to go to Alcohol Anonymous, to mm -hmm. AA, to to recover from this, you know, addiction. And um, he and I was just talking to him about Islam, and he said to me, you know what, it's very really interesting what you're telling me. I said, why is that? He said, because in, in AA, they ask us to connect to something outside, something above. Mm -hmm. And this is part of Sorry, go on, Doctor. Well, no, you're right. One of the 12 steps. Yeah, go on. Carry on. Yeah. So, I mean, so it's, it's so interesting. And I said, what, what is this greater thing? And he said, they don't say God. But he was saying it sort of sounds a lot like <laughs> this yes. higher, yeah. higher existence or something. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. And so the Quranic ayah, the, Qur the Quran is so beautiful because it obviously Allah recognizes and knows and Allah is the one who, who created the oh nature of the human being and this is why the verse that doctor quoted you know indeed in the remembrance of allah do the hearts do the souls find peace mm -hmm. and and so it, it basically without that connection you won't have peace and look look a classic example brother a classic classic example is our brothers and sisters in palestine mm -hmm. and their mm -hmm. connection to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has showed a beautiful example to even the non-Muslims who are today grappling with the concept of what is it that these people have that makes them so resilient and patient, still with a smile in their faces, still with gratitude, despite the horrors that they're going through. And they know it's Islam. And they're going out, they're buying Qur'ans, they're finding Qur'ans, and they're reading Qur'ans, and so many are accepting Islam as a consequence, right? Uh, this is the beauty with the connection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, if you don't have that connection, wallahi, life is miserable. Even though you may have some uh, periodic, you know, um, glimpses of some fun, but you talk to any man or any woman who le leads a hedonistic lifestyle, you know, gambling, women and men and all of these things casually just living there. Ask them, are you truly content and happy? Yes, not. They'd say no, yeah. they're not. And I've had many of these conversations and I haven't had one person come to me and said, you know what? The more hedonistic my life becomes, the, the more peace and the more happy I feel. It's the exact opposite. Anyway, brother, I hope that was been helpful, inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Zakmullah khair. Barakallah fi brother. Brother Hassan, we're going to get you on next very quickly. If you can quickly put your camera on, just give me a quick wave. If I, your sort of picture's gone wavy and uh, cloudy and foggy and lovely. We're going to get you on next, brother Hassan. 
Uh, if you can please kindly just ask your question straight away because we're running out of time. Assalamualaikum. Yeah. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I uh, just wanted to say thank you guys for the stream. Uh, quickly, just actually kind of the nature of the question. It's not going to be quick. I kind of asked something similar, similar before, but I'll, I'll try to make it brief. So, uh, you know, when we have, uh, when we discuss with Christians and Jews, like there's this tendency to like use their scripture to sort of support our, our theology, our theological viewpoints, you know, you know, don't heed and stuff like that. And like, uh, I'm just wondering, like, why isn't there an approach to like, you know, like, because, you know, in academia, like, like, I don't know how, like, from my understanding, like, it's already a foregone conclusion that like, the Old Testament, New Testament, that like, they're just, they are corrupted, they're unreliable, like, there's misattributions in them, like, so why isn't it that like, we use, um, why is it that we don't use like, sort of like, in like the academic approach to this sort of thing, where it's like, instead of using their scripture to support ours, we just say, well, your scripture is corrupted. And like, it doesn't it, it doesn't hold value from our perspective because it's not the Injil or the the Torah, right? I don't know if that makes sense, but like sometimes I see like you know like some of our uh, our like debaters like they kind of like do this thing where it's like oh in the in the you know Christian scripture for example it says like only the Father and this and that and like we sort of like uh, yeah like brother our, we, I, we 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 get the question I think it's it's a good question but the thing is that you'll find lots of people including brother Muhammad Ali I think I do it quite often I think Doctor does it as well okay um, Jordan as well which is that we're not claiming that these were necessarily the words of Jesus however from your paradigm in other words from what you believe these were the words of Jesus and therefore. If he has told you these things, why are you ignoring them? This is what we're saying to them. But right. of course, but of course, it's a two-prong discussion. And the discussion always does end up in why do you believe the Bible is a is a reliable source of information? And then we, we generally ask them the questions about why are there are these contradictions and why are these why are there are these errors. But from a person who believes their Bible to be um the word of God, something that needs to be followed and adhered to, uh, you have to show them the, the the hypocrisy as well of them not following even many of the commandments that are in the Bible. But at the same time, of course, you have to highlight the fact that it's corrupt and it's been changed. I'll let uh, Dr. or Jordan add anything to that, inshallah. Jordan, your thoughts, please. Um, yeah, I think Hamza does this a lot, doesn't he? When you, when you hear him speak and he kind of, it will either grant them um, <laughs> the scripture, or they'll say, "Look, it's not reliable." Um, Muslims do. Um, here's something. Here's something, and I don't know if it's interest of you that John Fontaine again told me a while ago. He was talking about so just because something is in the Bible and it agrees with the Quran, it doesn't mean it was in the Injil. I, I don't know that makes it doesn't necessarily yeah, mean yeah. it was wah wahi on, in that way. And that's something that really hit him because I've seen people make that mistake as well, where you assume just because it agrees with the Quran that all of a sudden you give them that that delivery. And that, that was something that was very, very eye opening for me. That's, yeah. yeah, I like that. I think that Do makes doctor, sense. Do you want to add anything? Yes, yeah, so I think part of the assumption is is that um, people are rational, <laughs> and they're not. They're not. Uh, so you're dealing with. So what happens, I think the analogy the scholars gave is that a, a, a man on a stallion riding. The stallion is our emotional side. And then the the man on the stallion is the akal, the intelligence that controls the rest of it. So the vast majority of people, um, they're very, very emotionally based. So when you're giving dawah to someone, this what you're trying to do ultimately is connect with them and take them a, a step closer towards Tawheed. And bring them to Islam. Ultimate, that's the ultimate aim. But you, you have to. The way of doing it is to connect with them and to bring them along. In, engaging in a so dismissing somebody that something from somebody who, that they've held uh, very close to themselves for a uh, very long time, just dismissing it out of hand. It's not reliable. It's clear academically. You sort of cut off a portion of that person from interacting with you and thinking with you. So you have to do two things. So one is, yes, you have to bring them towards the uh, uh, to Islam and you give them this, what Islam believes and now evidences, etc. The other thing is you have to show them the internal contradictions within what they're holding. So they need to let go because they need to do two things. They need to let go of what they have and go towards something else. So you want to 
facilitate both of those. So some people will understand, and, de- and it depends on the approach. So this is not something you would do with every single person. It depends on the person you're dealing with and you would interact with them. So if somebody is very focused on a certain part of their their scripture and their understanding, you could demonstrate for them why their understanding of what they believe and the words that you attribute to the person they believe uh, it to be Jesus or peace be upon him don't they don't coincide they 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 actually have an internal contradiction this is then for them now to rationalize why they're believing in something that goes against their own scripture and it helps them to come away from that whilst at the same time you're talking about calling them towards islam so i think it's not i think the danger is in giving um, one way of doing something to everyone I don't think that's the case. I think depending on who you're interacting with, you would adjust what you talk about. So some people, you could just, you know, if I'm if I'm speaking to somebody who maybe knows the acad, you know, the academics of textual yeah. criticism, you could do that route. But if you're talking to someone who's really, for example, Sister Tina's mother, uh, who's very 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 close and attached to her her faith, then what you would have to do is you have to do a cup a little bit of sort of unclicking the fingers from the grip. Uh, and that, that may be using the scripture to do that. So it's, I think it's quite an, it's, uh, you have to adjust your approach for the individual you're dealing with because we are dealing with individuals and most people aren't as rational as they, they say they are. They're very much very emotionally attached. Mm-hmm. Also, you know what, Doctor? I mean, it's very, cl- it's a classic example really about the Qadiani streams that you've been doing with Brother Adnan and Brother Imtiaz, right? You, we don't believe that uh, Mirza Qadiani was, uh, you know, uh, a prophet of God, and yet uh, Brother Imtiaz has done a master's degree <laughs> on their scriptures, on their uh, writings, on his writings rather. And, and much of the stream is relayed or re- relating to the things that he's written down. But of course, fundamentally, we don't believe that those things are from God. They're not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're not from a prophet. But you still have to deal with both sides of the argument. But I, I think, Doctor, your mashallah, your insight on the fact that we're not always logical, rational beings where you can just give logical and rational arguments and not engage with the emotional side of uh, things and the emotional ties people have. I think that is a really much, I think, a fundamental point there. Uh, Brother Hassan, I hope that's been helpful for you. Uh, it definitely has. Yeah. Also, uh, you know, thank you for your guys' time. I love these streams. I appreciate your guys' effort. Uh, also, just to add, like, uh, with, with Jordan's perspective in particular, I think he kind of, like, got a little bit close to what I'm getting at here. And I think what he just said is actually something I haven't heard before. I would love if, you know, maybe some other stream or something where he can expand upon that kind of viewpoint that uh, brother. Yeah, I know. I I think John Fontaine actually has written a book on this very topic. Uh, Maybe I'll try try and comment in the comments and get it linked or, um, yeah. Right. Okay, and just uh, I probably not enough time for this. Maybe in some other time, but I, if you guys can like just comment, and I, maybe you can just like I don't have to talk after this, but like I understand obviously that you know there there is a necessity for some scripture at some point to have been like valid because you know there was references to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at some point. At, at least we believe that there's an eye in the Quran. I think it was somewhere in us. I don't remember the exact surah, but it's a reference that Jesus Alayhi Salam said that. Uh, you know, there will be another another prophet, you know, by the name of Ahmed, right? And I know that, you know, there's this connection that's often made where it's like, it's the Paracletos or something like that. But, you know, I think that's operating under the assumption that, you know, the New Testament, Old Testament are somewhat like still in like their, you know, somewhat uncorrupted state. But could it not be the case that like this was in reference to the Jews and Christians of the Arabian Peninsula in particular? And that was it. And like after that, you know, the the script, I mean, because and we have obviously evidence that like the scriptures of the Christians and Jews are, you know, vastly different. The the biblical, the canons are different if you go from Ethiopia to like whatever, like some books, some have more books, some have less books. So it's there's evidence already to like kind of confirm that viewpoint. But I'm just wondering, is there something logically like that I'm not I'm missing in that in the fact that that cannot in, in fact be a tenable case that the you know the Jews and the the, the script that reference was in particularly in particular to the Jews and Christians of the Arabian Peninsula and that's it like maybe they were the last of the you know true scripture holders if that makes sense. Um, so, Doctor Imran, if you want to just quickly add to that and then we'll get the next guest on inshallah because uh, that looks like another topic I think to, to discuss. Yeah, so- I mean, th- there's nothing to stop you holding that view. The The problem is going to be sort of establishing that view as as, as credible. 
Um, and the reason you're going to have to establish that view is credible is because, uh, you know, the, there was no Bible in the old, in, there's no Bible in the Arab Peninsula that we could find. The, the first Arabic Bibles were 10th century. And then to, to hold, so it, it seems to be that you're sort of arguing, let, let's completely ignore the, the Christian scriptures as in our Dawa, which is fine as an approach, because sometimes you can argue from, uh, I tend to deal directly with the theology, so I talk about, you know, the problem with the crucifixion, the problem with the, maybe the Trinity, the, the disparity between Judaism and Christianity and Islam, and which one is the odd one out. So you can do these sorts of different approaches. Um, you can talk about the crime narrative, but at some point you've got to interact with the thing they're holding with, holding on to. So um, I, what Brother Jordan was talking about was uh, very interesting as well about the fact that we, can we say that what is in the New Testament now is any of it is even an echo of the Injil. And I think that's a, that's a, uh, he makes a very valid point that that's a bit of a jump that we're making and an assumption that we're making. And maybe it's something that uh, could be something like, a, uh, you know, someone has paraphrased something that could have been, but it's not, you can't refer to it as the Injil. But I think it's moot because the Injil we know is something that's given to Isa al -Islam, and what we have is not from Isa al -Islam, So it doesn't really matter. Well, I think what matters is that what, what you're missing in this approach is you're dealing with a person. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when you're dealing with a person, it's really important that you you interact with them and help them to move along their journey. So we might have certain views. So I might, okay, I don't believe in the Bible. Okay, that's my position. I don't believe in it. Well, can I, is there anything I can do to help this person move a few steps closer towards Islam by using something from their text to show them that their beliefs not only contradict us, but they contradict what they're holding in their hands? wherever that's from corrupted or uncorrupted and i think sometimes if you use that approach it helps them to reevaluate much easier than if you're just trying to sideline them completely and everything they hold is you know actually you know, it's off limits you have to deal with me on my terms because then you're excluding them from the discussion Thank you, well, you Hassan, i hope that's been helpful Thank you. for coming on it was, it was very useful. Thank you so much. For this. Okay, my brother. Oh, okay. My brother Khalid, if you want to quickly put your camera on um, and then just quickly try, just give me a quick, yeah, wave. Lovely. We're going to get you on next. You can turn your camera off if you like. Um, Khalid, welcome to the stream. Hello. Yeah, so I have two really quick questions. Yeah, so I, like I remember it. hearing, Walik Islam. I remember hearing um, a story about how. Uh, Allah, our souls, Allah's souls showed us our whole life and then decided, asked us if we wanted to go into the world. And then he said yes to go into the world. But Sorry, did you say Khalid? Did you say Allah shows us the whole of our life? <clears throat> uh, yeah, something along those lines. I, I'm not 100% sure I'm paraphrasing, but this is something I've heard. So I, I was just not, thinking uh, not, not shows us it, how valid. No, no, not shows as in, us. But Khalid, sorry to correct you, brother. It's not shows us all our lives. Allah asks the question to us because we're in the presence of Allah. Um, and Allah makes the confirmation that they that we all believe and we all testify that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what happens. Okay, then that clears up my question because I was I was just thinking, why would a somebody who's seen their life as a kafir want to Go down no, into the world, and I was a bit confused by that. That's that's wrong. The What's second, your... yeah, the second one is my main question. Um, yeah, so I've been suffering from maybe a bit of hyper skepticism. Like, imagine if I'm looking at ingredients, then, for example, whey protein powder it could be extracted using synthetic materials, animal materials. But I also heard a sheikh say that you shouldn't let doubt take away from certainty. Certainty. So, like, how would you balance? between like hyper skepticism to stay on the right path but also not having was was and you no know, yeah. so let it take over your life can i ask first where, where did you get the information from the first question i'm unsure i i remember hearing it like on somewhere i'm unsure but i i remember hearing a, a decent amount that's why i just asked i didn't think it was valid just because i thought it was like a contradictory statement but i just wanted to double check yeah, I guess I was asking just, uh, I guess, but when we're talking about doubts and things, often the sources we use and the information and the people we get it from um, 
can often be important, isn't it? If we're going on, for example, I'm not saying you are, but if we're going on anti-Islam websites or if we're just cherry, you know, going on Google and, and not really checking our, our things, then I'm sure it can land you in a whole lot of knots if your foundations aren't aren't completely there. But um, I'll hand it over. It's not really a doubt of mine. I was just uh, just seeing what your guys' thoughts was on it. No problem. Doctor, if you can quickly answer that and then we'll get Brother Musa on, inshallah. <clears throat> Uh, okay, alhamdulillah. So, uh, Brother Khalid, you sound very young. Do you mind if I asking how old you are? I'm 19 now. I just sound a lot younger than I am. Okay, alhamdulillah. May Allah bless you. Uh, so, Brother, what I would say is that <clears throat> this this approach of being sceptical about everything is a Western approach. And it's particularly a Western philosophical approach where they say, look, we can't know anything. How are we going to then establish everything? And that's not the reality. This is not how we envisage the human being. We the, in, in, we were talking about the fitra earlier, the hum, and you spoke about the alam al the where the souls bore witness that Allah is our Lord before they were sent to the earth into and sold into the bodies and were born. So we're not we're not these blank slates. So for example, it's things things that are even self evident when you're hyper skeptical become like, am I real? Am I, am I, is what I'm seeing the same as what someone else is seeing? So this Khalid K has a purple circle. But actually, all I know, the only reason I know that's purple is because everyone's only pointed to that thing and said it's purple. Could it be that Abbas is looking at this thing and seeing something different but still calling it purple and our vision is not the same, seeing the same thing? You can just, you know, you can, and even there are people now talking about everything is a simulation. We're in a simulation because there are quantum waves. Wherever you turn and the observer sees that particle, it becomes manifest and it's real. But when you turn away, it's no longer real. And so they talk about that whatever's in your vision, in your conscious, is what's real and everything else isn't. It's a, it's a, it's a nightmare. It, you, you will completely end up in a place where you don't know anything. But yet you get up in the morning, you eat your food. You know, you, you, you go to, if, you know, if you're studying, you go to study, you know, you, you sit your exams, you, you know, you, you're polite with people, you obey the traffic lights. All of these things are in your experience. You make decisions, you, you see the, the outcomes of your choices. The reality is actually, yes, you know, we're living in the real world and we have everything that we see around us as well. And so you could, the hyper skepticism, you've got to put it in its place. It's a philosophical tool used by some people when they were doing mind games mind experiments thought experiments to help them to come to some sort of uh, way of thinking about how the world is nothing to do with the reality the reality is you know that you know that you're real and you know that Allah exists you know this is intuitive there are ways to arrive at this in a rational way as well but actually if I were to grab you and chuck you out of a plane we were talking earlier straight away you will know Allah exists because you'll be asking him to save you and this is this is the point so don't so what you need to do is to understand what this hyper skepticism is and leave it in its box use it when you need to use it but don't let it come up and infect you so that it's about everything because you could get you know you're going to end up in a stage where you don't even know if your parents are your parents mm. you know, was i was i swapped at birth was i i didn't do a dna test you know mm. Mm. so hyper skepticism is a is a malaise of the west uh, western philosophical thought and actually mm. it puts people in places where they are uh, nihilistic nothing is important nothing matters nothing is real and that's the type of was you don't want to get into brother um mm -hmm. Khalid, what, are your, what are your thoughts i know i've said a lot to you um yeah that, that makes sense yeah before i used to suffer from a lot of was was but um start to check out just wondering you know there's a balance to it i thought there was a balance to it just because you want to make sure you don't you don't want to be like heedless in like the type of food you consume, never checking if it's halal or not, or the yeah. type of environment you're in, or yeah, etc. Right. etc. You're right. You do you do you tie your camel. That means you do your best to verify. So if you go into a halal meat shop and you say, "Brother, I'm Islam alaikum, brother, wife Islam," and he's giving you meat halal, you're going to take. You're not going to assume. Oh, maybe he's just giving me salam, but the. You know, I want to meet the person who did the slaughtering and then I'm going to check his Akida and then I'm going to... It's because it will take you into a place where things are crazy. But what I wanted to say, you, you're a young guy, mashallah, you know, may I preserve you. Are you, are you doing, are you enrolled in any uh, program where you're learning from the 
some people around you, some knowledgeable people in terms of Islam and stuff, or or not? Not yet, not yet. I plan well, which, to. Uh... Which country are you in, brother? In London. Okay, alhamdulillah. So definitely get in touch. Um, you know, you know, the Sapiens have loads and loads of courses that are free online on their website. You can go through them and they will help you to sort of do, go through a lot of these things. Get involved with them, volunteer, do the dawa with them. Because um, I, what, I, what I want to do is in the next five years time, turn back and say, oh, this is Sheikh Khaled, he's coming on our stream, mashallah, he's going to be talking about this particular topic of, of atheism and hyper-skepticism and he's going to be giving you the, build yourself up brother. Get involved, you know, if you're get involved with the scholars, so you're learning all of the things that can benefit you, um, because <coughs> ultimately that's that's what's going to uh, make an impact not only in your life but in the life of the people around you. So become an impact impactful person in Umma, inshallah, brother. Yeah, inshallah. Thank you for this. Right, uh, just very quickly before you go, very very quickly, the Prophet peace be upon him said, "Do not take your religion to extremes." Don't yeah. take your religion to extremes. Make your best effort. Alhamdulillah, balance of probability. If something is quite highly likely, it's halal, it's good. Alhamdulillah, do it. Don't think about the extreme situations. Brother Khalid, Jazakallah Khair for coming on. Thank you. Jazakallah Khair. Uh, Brother Musa, we're going to get you on next. You can leave your camera off or you can uh, leave your camera on. Uh, Brother Musa, we're going to get you on next, inshallah. Brother Musa, welcome to the stream. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Somebody mentioned something about uh, something very interesting earlier. Uh, I wanted to give you a good uh, narration from Hafsa, uh, that, uh, obviously the wife of the Prophet, radiallahu ta'ala anha. You mentioned about um, how so many people are coming to Islam lately, which is is good alhamdulillah so i'd like to share something with you qala hafsa radiyallahu ta'ala anha sami'tu rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inna ad-dajjal yakhruju ghadbatan yaghdabuha which means hafsa said i heard the prophet peace be upon him say indeed the dajjal will break out in extreme anger and he will rage the reason for this is because when Imam al-Mahdi is out and known, I'm not talking about the Shia Imam al-Mahdi, by the way, um, when he becomes known to the people, he will re-establish the Khilafah and re-establish the Sharia because he's going to do a Tajdeed. At the end of every century, a Mujaddid is sent at the turn of the century to do a Tajdeed. And what you find is the scholars at that time will be his worst enemies. They will fight him relentlessly because he will be telling them all that they're wrong about a lot of things in order to do the Tejdeed. Now, when the rightly guided Imam does this, obviously all of the converts to Islam, the whole Muslim Ummah will be, um, hopefully all of us will be made aware of the Tejdeed. The, this is what will cause the Masih al-Dajjal to rage and break his chains because so many people have come to the deen and at the moment it's a bit of chaos. There's chaos everywhere because we have charlatan scholars that are misguiding people now, which is a very big thing. Celebrity scholars that really don't have knowledge of what they're talking about. And uh, a lot of people are being misguided. So at the moment, a lot of people are coming into the Dean, but on incorrect uh, premises. Um, I don't want to get too much into that because that might cause arguments between some. Brother, if I could uh, just respe if I could just respectfully say, what it is that we're already over time on the stream. Was there a specific question? Because, Mashallah, you're quite learned. I can tell, Mashallah, you've been studying for a while. Yeah, I've seen uh, sometimes. I'm, 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 I'm assuming you're not going to ask us a dawah related question. Because, Mashallah, Allah's blessed you with knowledge, Alhamdulillah. But was it just that you wanted to refer to the point, or was there a question, any question that you wanted to I just thought I'd add to your, um, the, the, whoever mentioned the uh, point earlier about the amount of converts. There was something I'd like to. Uh, Ah, uh, what was it? 
it was something for the doctor. Something that was said earlier about cutting off parents. Somebody mentioned, do we cut off certain parents? Doctor Imran, I'd like to know your feedback on this. Now, I've done a lot of research on this in order to reach this conclusion. I don't know uh, what you're a doctor of, uh, psychology or medicinal practice, or but uh, this is a bit of psychology here. I've concluded from the attributes of the shayateen al-insan mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah that uh, the diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder actually quite aptly describes who Allah and his messenger describe as shayateen al-insan, devils among mankind. I thought you might find this interesting because the guy who mentioned about cutting off parents earlier I really wanted to say to him, um, narcissists actually diagnosed ones I'm talking about, which is never a good idea to try and self-diagnose with such a serious thing. I wouldn't encourage that. Um, Actual diagnosed narcissists, the best thing to do with them, whether they're your parents, your spouse, you find out your spouse is a narcissist. Honestly, I know this is going to sound harsh, but cancel them out of your life altogether Hmm. because they will lead you to your grave. There's only one thing narcissists are concerned about, which is how crap they feel about themselves. And therefore they want everybody else around them to feel worse than they do. So they're inclined to pulling everyone down that they target. Brother Musa, but you know, ultimately, there is a point to be careful of because it could be that the one who is accusing the other of being a narcissist may actually be. That's why I said don't self diagnose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Go to go to go go to a scholar, go to ulama, learned people, explain the situation, and Mm -hmm. sometimes you know mediation is very powerful have some sort of mediation, have some scholar to speak to your spouse or your mother, do, you it, with, with, do it with kindness and inshallah, the then go with um, their view. And if there is some psychological issue, then of course we have to go to a psychologist. Yeah, if yeah. there's just a, a simple coaching issue of mediation or something, we can go to a coach or a mediator. If someone's diagnosed yeah. with them, Brother Musa, Jazakallah for coming on. It was a real pleasure to have you on. May Allah bless you. And inshallah, please remember us in your dua, inshallah. Can I uh, ask one more thing? Uh, v- very quickly, because we're really yeah. over time, but go on. I don't know what you're going to make of this, but um, one of my friends who knows you actually suggested that I should probably mention this on your podcast um i'm looking for a a wife inshallah and uh what we suggest is uh email us i don't uh, have a family so that's fine no problem so email us um, what we can do because this is a very personal thing yeah we have to just email us inshallah that email will come up on the screen and then what we can do, brother, is we can speak with you personally and you don't have to put your personal matters on the internet. And then we can try and facilitate anything we can for you, inshallah. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's the email for you, if you can see that. Just email us on this email and we'll take it from that point, inshallah. When you go back to YouTube and watch the video again, you'll see the email on there, inshallah, brother. Ah, uh, yeah. Right. Yes, that's quite easy. Yes, that's that's at gmail.com. Okay, alhamdulillah. Uh, last, uh, mashallah, finale. Uh, uh, we can't call you. I just want to say, before you bring the last one, so I just want to say, actually, that it, that it is, just, just to put it out there, because I don't want to look like we just stopped the brother, so it actually is very hard for the reverts uh, yeah. to find mm. yeah. Yeah. stable. Yeah. Families that will yeah. marry, they can marry into sisters as well as the brothers. Um, there is a hierarchy, the brothers tend to find it harder than the sisters do. Yeah, um, and actually, the even amongst the brothers, even sisters who are from a, a maybe a, 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 a racial back ethnic background where their skin is darker or something mm. like this, or African mm. sisters, they find it even harder. And same for the African brothers, mm. so there is definitely this need. Uh, you know, may Allah make it easy for all the brothers and sisters looking for marriage. Yeah. And, um, and give them good spouses and give them the best. Yeah. 
I mean, um, so what we'll do is uh, we're definitely going to interact with the brother to try and help in whichever way we can. Inshallah. But no, it's not I, a, it's not, it wasn't done because of any other reason than we want to preserve the honor of the brother and not mm, 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 Absolutely. I think the other thing, that, Doctor, you know, um, and, I, and, I, and I want to really um, perhaps especially tell the brothers if you marry a revert, uh, remember they're coming from often a very a, a situation often of trust. Because when they first come into Islam, they are, are and, and Jordan, you can probably confirm this that when you first accept Islam, it's a eu euphoric, a mm. euphoric sort of existence for the first few weeks, months, whatever, because you're on a real high. You've just come into this, you know, subhanAllah, this complete way of life. It's a transformation in every way. And and sometimes uh, brothers uh, take advantage of these sisters who come in and they accept Islam um, because they assume that because you are a Muslim, then everything they have read about Islam and about what it is to be a Muslim is probably what you're going to be like. Okay. So please, I would say, respect that and understand that, you know, if you do show injustice in this way, it's a, it's a serious offense and it's a serious crime. And I always say to sisters and to brothers as well who accept Islam and they're new converts, they accept, you know, six months ago, eight months ago, don't rush into marriage, I would say. Yeah, good advice. Do, do not rush into marriage and always, please, consult uh, a, a, a person of trust, an imam or somebody who is, you know, mashallah, not just um, trained um, from a different culture, but it's also trained within the culture that you're wanting to marry in. So they can ask the right questions from the brother or from the sister to make sure that you're not being sort of led down the garden path. Uh, this yeah. is something that we need to really, as a society, as a, as a community, really work towards. And Dr. Mashallah, you raise a very important point about how difficult it is for converts sometimes to get married. And and part of those reasons can be, astaghfirullah, um, uh, you know, uh, racism. And Islam completely forbids racism, subhanAllah. The Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, when he rebuked a companion who said a word that was racist, what did he say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He said that there's still jahiliya in you. There's still ignorance in you. So we, we need to really think about that and open our doors. And the other thing is that, Jordan, and I'm sure you'll agree with this, is that new Muslims require a lot of support. You know, um, there are, mashallah, Sheikh, I don't want to give his name because he might not want to give his name, but he does a lot of work with new Muslims. And sometimes, you know, there are sisters, subhanAllah, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, their parents kick them out of the house because they've accepted Islam and they're young, 18, 19 years old. You know, he said I had to wake my wife up and then we had to go to uh, two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning and pick this sister up so she could have a place to sleep, you know, and then they arranged for her to, um, to, 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 to sort of get accommodation. So these are things as a community, as an ummah, we need to be aware of these things. We need to help our brothers and our sisters and support them. Uh, invite them round for Eid, invite them round to open their fasts. Don't assume that they've got a, a structure, a social structure already ready for them because they don't. And so we, we need to, inshallah, all of us at, attempt to at least spend time with our new Muslim brothers and sisters, invite them for, for dinner, have some sort of social interaction. Uh, we had a brother who came down, uh, Speaker's Corner from Sheffield, and he was saying the same thing. I don't really know anybody. <laughs> and so we're going to try to put him in touch with Chris. We're going to try to put him in touch with other brothers so mm -hmm. he can go to lunch and dinner with and, and just have some sort of social yeah. expression. It's very, very important. Maybe we can make this as, as, a, as a topic in itself, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This, is a really, this is a really important topic, uh, comment. Yeah. The yeah. idealization works both ways. Reverts to born Muslims and born Muslims idealizing, idealizing yeah. reverts. I totally agree, and, with that, that. and we've got to we've got to come away from this. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how uh, it's a, it's a, maybe it's a bit of a uh, the remnants of a colonial mindset that's still within us, some sort of inferiority mm -hmm. complex, because yeah. actually not, it's not all people that are idealized by by any particular groups. It's just some mm -hmm. amongst them, 
and you've got to really think why is this happening um mm-hmm. yeah. so you know, it's a very very really important point from, from, from yeah, yeah. 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 I, I think the point about them um i think abbas you sort of illuminate and you Miran, about them being vulnerable and i think even by law i think when someone changed their religion they're actually recognized as vulnerable adults and yes, i think yes. these are people that are Absolutely. you know changing their life they could be lonely losing family members and they are people that can be really kind of preyed upon and I, I remember when i i converted a lot i mean i was lucky i had you guys and i had um I had a lot of people around me but people were as soon as i converted you know, you've got to get married now brother you've got to get married there's no way i was ready um yeah. straight, up, yeah. straight after it took me a while to ground myself um and yeah. and yeah it's, it's and also I, I would say the other point i make is as a you know western guy I'm, I'm used to interacting with with the opposite sex in a different way and all of a sudden you come into islam and you you're not supposed to do that not supposed to do that you don't really know where to go after that mm, mm, and mm. It's, not, it's not an easy process um mm, you don't really mm. know so yeah may Allah make it easy for the the brother that mm. came on before uh, absolutely oh, yeah. uh, absolutely uh we're gonna get our brother sioni on who we yeah. love dearly brother sioni <laughs> the beard's coming mashallah <laughs> Uh, Wa alaikum salam, brothers. How are you? Uh, how are you doing, yeah. brother? You're right. Sorry to keep you waiting for such, such a long time. But I wanted no, to no, leave. No, you. It's, it's all I good. wanted. I wanted to. I wanted to have you as the grand finale. You know, the conclusion <laughs> of the stream. <laughs> uh, too much of a too high of a pedestal for me. <laughs> how are you doing, brother? Yeah, yeah, you okay. Alhamdulillah. Just I just got back from work. The only reason I came on and I wrote a comment in the backstage. It wasn't to come on the stream and delay everything for you guys. I know it's late. <clears throat> you were talking to a brother earlier, and I don't know if it's a poem or something. It's some. It's something that Dr. Imran has quoted in the past in previous streams. It's either from a old church father or theologian or something. It's. I think it's something to do with crucifixion or salvation yes, I, remember, or I remember this yeah so I, I did a video about a long time ago 2006 or something like this it's on my channel um mm. it's it's called dying rising gods and yeah. in in that one of the things i quote is a a greek poet called sk laws uh, i think 540 bc and he wrote he writes a, a book called prometheus bound that was the name of the book and in that, there's a poem that I quote, which is uh, low streaming from the... And I remember, the reason I remember this is because I, I had to learn it for the video <laughs> to, to say it, and it's just stuck <laughs> in my head. Uh, low streaming from the uh, from the eternal trees, all atoning blood. Is this the infinite, tis he? Well, might the sun in darkness hide and veil his glories in when God the great Prometheus died for man, the creature's sin? And so this is really Christian theology, but in a pagan god. And mm. what I can do is, uh, brother um, uh, Sione, I'll, I'll 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 find the reference for that and send it to you. But it was a book uh, written by Robert Blake, pastor. I think he was a pastor who was imprisoned because he set up something called the Christian Evidence Society, and uh, he he was in prison and he wrote the book in prison and he quotes a lot of the similarities between the soteriology religions, the religions that believe in a dying rising God, and Christianity. And I actually had to get the book published specifically because it wasn't available in print. It was mm-hmm. written in the 1800s, and it, the quote was from there. But I'll, I'll uh, send there. I'll take a picture of that and send it to you, inshallah. Um, inshallah. So you have a hand. No, that's cool. It's just something that always pops in my head whenever mm-hmm. I hear people talking about crucifixion, resurrection. Yeah, subhanallah. I and even forget- Ovid, the, poet, the Ovid, he was a well, number of poet BC. He wrote in BC. He talked mm. about the folly of people who believe that someone can die for your sins. And this was way before Christ, you know, Ovid the poet. Yeah. Uh, he wrote this. So there's lots of references, but I'll I'll send you the video of the uh send you the video link, inshallah, and also the these references, inshallah. Inshallah. Brother Sioni, what's for dinner? What's for dinner? <laughs> Most you important mean, question. You mean breakfast? Oh breakfast. What for breakfast? <laughs> It's like 20 past 10 in the morning here. Oh, is it? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's all good. My days are always upside down, back to front to most people anyway. So <clears throat> it is weird. So I'll go, like, I'll get home and then I'll have to go somewhere and I'll see someone. And I'm like, good evening. But it's just, that's the way my brain's wired because I've been doing it for so many years. So mm. hard. Um, May yeah. I preserve you. Anyway. It's always, it okay. was always lovely to speak to you. And inshallah, I'll speak to you soon again, my brother. Yeah. Inshallah. Good stream as always. 
Alhamdulillah, I think we got through quite a few, mashallah, brothers and sisters' questions there, alhamdulillah. Um, so, um, Jordan, any last words before we go, inshallah? Um, oh, not really. Uh, always a pleasure to be on the stream with you guys. Always a blessing. Uh, Jack, for inviting me on. Um, I think since our conversation at the park, um, Abbas, the fitter has really been in my mind. That, that really hit me with that guy. Um, yeah. Like I said, um, it really is a lesson that someone in front of you, you could be given the dawa and they may have all of the skepticism. That's all rubbish. Your religious nonsense, blah, blah, blah. The question at the end that you asked him beautifully um, about, you know, in, you know, a plane crashing, admitted that he prayed to God. And that's sort of been, um, yeah. I guess, yeah. I've been wondering, well, maybe this that's the key, isn't it? Uh, yeah. We can have a lot of these intellectual arguments and back and forth, mm -hmm. but how do you ignite that person's fitra? How do you kind mm -hmm. of get, get to the bottom of yeah. that? And, uh, yeah. yeah. You know, Jordan, what was very telling is that um, <clears throat> they, when they converse with you, are telling you that they're absolutely convinced that there's no merit whatsoever in believing this thing. It's like completely false. There's just yeah. no reason behind it whatsoever. So, Abba, so a couple of times I said, okay, can you repeat what Abba said then? And there was not no yeah. ability. It wasn't yeah. even listening. Yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. And so what was really interesting is that that sort of negative um, response that, you know, it's just all rubbish. You, well, there's, That's not evidence. That's not evidence. That's why. But wh why would you then start praying to God? If you're that convinced that it's just nonsense, why would you then pray to God? So in your heart of hearts, somewhere deep inside, you know when there's nothing else to turn to, when you're in a complete dead end and, you know, you know now that there's nothing that can help you on, the, on earth, what do you do? You turn to the heavens and you start praying to God. Because it strips away the pretenses. Yeah, yeah. We have this facade that we put up on this intellectual uh, armor, and you know all this. But when you're in that t that moment where it's it's all over, it's just there's unclear. no everything. Everything is stripped away. Just the reality is there that I am a minute away, seconds away from dying. It strips away all the pretenses. It's gone. All the masks go away. The armor falls away, and it's just you're you're naked and vulnerable before the only being that can save you. And you know this is the creator, and it's just it's subhanallah. It is that there's no there's no atheist in a crashing plane. So and this is why, I mean, even Pharaoh, we're told when he's drowned, that on his last, you know, last brink, he wanted to accept the Lord of Moses. But it was too late. You know, and so, and, 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 and Pharaoh, he, you know, Allah describes him in the Quran as one of the most uh, heinous of people that existed, what he did, the crimes that he did against the the children of the of the of the Jews, you know, killing all of them and denying Musa al Islam, denying the uh, miracles, doing all of that, and they'd be obstinate, you know, and all of the things that he did, and yet the last brink of death, last gasp, he wanted to say, "I, I believe in the Lord of of of, uh, of Moses, Subhanallah." But he was, but he prevented from doing that. Anyway, um, Doctor Imran, any last words before we go, Inshallah? Um, just obviously, we know we well, everything is happening in Palestine. Remember to pray for our brothers and sisters there. Um, just you know, we we heard about that soldier who set himself alight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as a protest, um, it's 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 a uh, mixed feelings about this. To be honest with you, I just wanted to say that he died, right? Did he die? He yeah. died. He died mm -hmm. from his doing that. That it's. I think one of the reasons it's moving is it's an it's an, it's an act of great sincerity. This person mm. was, you know, uh, really affected by what's happening that his country was doing in his name, and he mm. took his own life as a as a protest. Um, Actually, what he needed, and Sheikh Haytham said this, and if you look for his talk on this particular event, he says suggests that we let him down as Muslims, that he should have been given dawah, that he should have been had, because if it, this, bro uh, this brother, if he'd had an interaction, because he's an activist, he's pro-Palestinian, uh, pro-Islam, mm. to a certain extent, because of that, if, pro if we had, yeah. yeah, because if we had that opportunity maybe to speak to that individual, 
to put everything into the context to understand that everything is from Allah and there is wisdom and etc. And what his purpose in life is, then maybe this is something because he had a lot of potential. If that individual was still available today to speak out and to have that effect, then it would have he would have made even had even greater impact. But this is gratefully impactful. It's a sad this was the way that he had to go. Mela make it easy for his family. Yeah. And you know, Mela deal with him justly in whatever which he will in whatever he decides what to do with him. But the whole point here is is that um, this is not something that uh it's taking a life is your own life is not something that's from Islam. Mm-hmm. And the bigger picture is actually that there are it's not just Muslims who are feeling the pain. There are lots and lots of people around mm-hmm. the world feeling the pain. And what we really need to do is to to reach out as much as we can to the people around us to speak, mm-hmm. to engage, to help people to understand where the where this great faith of the Palestinians that they're demonstrating day by day is coming from. Um, and so really it's, it's called for more Dawa, not less Dawa, inshallah. And really I just want to say, remember the Palestinians in your duas. Uh, may Allah make it easy for them and protect them, preserve them and remove them from any oppression, inshallah. The... I mean, apart from that, Dizakhlakev, brothers, lovely to see you, brother Jordan and brother Abbas, brother Ijaz as well, always learn a lot from you guys. The mods do an amazing role, may Allah protect them and preserve them and increase their families, inshallah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, really are admirable. They're always here at the start to the finish and they, they persevere. We really, we are honored. Mm-hmm. And uh, the brothers Ijaz and, uh, sorry, brother Ayaz and Anis who are in the background doing a lot of work. May Allah bless them as well, inshallah. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, everything is from Allah. Uh, may Allah forgive uh, uh, anything good is from Allah and anything wrong and an error is from ourselves and from Shaitan. May Allah forgive our shortcomings and may Allah purify our attention for his sake, inshallah. Ameen. 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 Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.